come to the 2019-2020 uh, budget hearings uh, on June 17, 2019. I'm gonna call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Coonerty. Here. Great. Uh, now I'm gonna ask you to join me in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, are there any addition, late additions or addi additions or deletions to the agenda? Yes, there's uh, one correction, item number 26. Uh, the, the item should read, action on the consent agenda, item number 31. Okay, great. Uh, now is the opportunity for oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are not on our agenda today. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to us? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, this is moving on to item number five, which is open remark, opening remarks in a public hearing. This is our CAO's chance to uh, let us know about this budget. I've heard it's a, uh, an important day, and it must be because our information service director is wearing a suit today, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's a big day. Uh, so, Mr. Palacios? Yes, he wears a suit whenever he's asking for money. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it's a good, good practice. <laughs> uh, Chair Coonerty, members of the board, uh, your session this morning opens the 2019-2021 budget hearings. Um, so it's a, it's a two-year budget for the very first time for the county. Uh, the, the documents before you today include the CAO's proposed budget, um, which includes the accounting item uh, detail. In addition, you have the supplemental budget, which includes additional financial actions, reports, the unified fee schedule, continuing agreements list. Our office will be presenting any last day reports, including a financial update and concluding actions prior to the close of the budget on June 25th. And as always, all of the budget documents are posted on the County of Santa Cruz website. So let me give you an overview of our presentation today. I'm gonna cover county initiatives and the operational plan, uh, which coincides with my own uh, work plan that the board has endorsed. Uh, our county budget officer will give an overview of the budget. Um, she'll also go into the two, year, two years of this budget, 2019-2020, which is the recommended budget, and then 2021, 2020, 2021, which is the projected budget overview. And so this is the very first time the county has done a two-year budget. Uh, according to state law, we are only allowed to adopt the 1920, so that's the one that you'll be uh, taking official legal action on the 25th. The 2021 is really uh, a very detailed projection. I think it's a good practice, though, and in effect, uh, we have taken it very seriously as a county, and our departments have as well. Um, because it is um, give us that longer outlook, um, which is very necessary, I think, to um, long-term planning. And then finally, I will come back and talk about the challenges and opportunities facing the county. We'll start with the county initiatives and operational plan. So this is the work plan that I presented to you two years ago and which your board endorsed. And I'm very proud to say that we've accomplished the first three of those items already. Our strategic plan, which took a year to develop, is a six-year document, which the board adopted last year, and includes a vision, mission, values, and also goal focus areas. Um, the focus areas, there's six of them. Each one of the focus areas has four goals. Uh, that really is, um, the guiding document, the North Star for the county. Uh, this year we are presenting for the very first time our operational plan and our two-year budget, which are companion documents, which really uh, implement that strategic vision. Um, and then the ongoing efforts, which will be um, really um, beginning this year is, or next year is a performance evaluation, the evaluating part. Uh, we really haven't begun this effort. We're just starting it uh, in the fiscal year. Uh, that's the third year of my being CAO, which I, 
uh, indicated when I started the job. That would be the third year effort. Uh, we will be doing in this coming year um, a lot of training with our staff um, and some um, pilot projects. Uh, as I have mentioned before, there are some departments that are more uh, advanced in performance evaluation um, and others that are just beginning, but as a whole county, we, we will be undertaking performance evaluation um, in this coming uh, year. And we've already started our PRIMO effort, which is our continuous process improvement with pilot projects this year, and we'll be further rolling, out, rolling that out in the coming year. So our strategic and operational plan, uh, as I mentioned, there are six focus areas. Each focus area has four, four uh, overarching goals. The planning cycle is that we, the strategic plan drives everything, our operational plan and our two-year budget, our companion documents, which implement the strategic vision. And then next year, we will begin the effort to train our staff in performance measurement, and we are continuing uh, to implement pilot projects and continuous process improvement. Um, I will uh, mention that this has been a huge lift for the county. This is, these are not minor efforts, these are major efforts. It's a change in county culture, and it's really been um, a monumental effort by the, um, our departments uh, to do this, and I'm very proud of them because they've produced really, really <coughs> first-rate documents uh, that we can be very proud of, uh, and especially given that the first time that we've, we've done them. So the operational plan, uh, so this is a concrete two-year plan that details the county's first step in achieving its vision. Countywide strategies indicate what we will do to achieve county goals, while department objectives and key steps say how this will be done. Uh, departments will be highlighting their operational plan objectives throughout the budget hearing presentation. So each budget presentation will include some highlights of their operational goals. And then they're, of course, open to talk to you more in depth about those goals. And then on the 25th, there will be a overview of the entire operational plan um, by the CAO's office. Um, and you can see how they relate in this uh, chart, the strategic plan, vision, mission, values, um, who we are, what we value, what we believe in, uh, what are our goals, and then you can see the operational plan is what we will do and how we will do it and how it's funded in the budget. The operational plan was a, a very major effort, uh, started last September with a steering committee and subcommittees of county staff. We had training on SMART objectives in October in November, December, we started drafting objectives and key steps. Uh, January, we gave feedback, uh, continued to, offer, to uh, f refine the elements in February, March. In April, we rolled out the plan to the community, met with focus groups and did some community outreach. And then we're now in the process of having the board review it and the board adopt it. The community engagement has been and continues to be an important component in developing the strategic and operational plan. Uh, draft strategies were presented to over 20 boards and commissions and at six community open houses uh, held in North, Mid, and South County. And additionally, seven focus groups were held with key informants, community representatives, and subject matter expertise in strategic plan focus areas. And again, for a first step, uh, I'm very proud of our staff um, for what they have done to achieve what I think is a very, very good document and a good starting point for the county in terms of developing an operational plan which ties our overall strategic goals to our budget. So this is just an example of um, more detail on the operational plan. And this is an example of an objective it's uh, number 64, objective number 64, and it's in the Health Services Agency. You'll actually find it in the operation plan on page 30 and on page 146. And it says, by June 2021, Health Services Agency will increase access to health care by decreasing the wait time for the next available appointment from an average of 1.3 days down to zero days. So it's a very concrete, smart objective, which is exactly what we want. And then if you were to turn to page 173 in the budget, you'll actually find uh, this, which is the salaries and benefits, um, and details how we're gonna implement and achieve that 
objective, and it says the cost, which is $1.7 million to achieve that objective. So uh, we understand that at the present time, the operational plan and the budget, uh, that the link between those is not what we exactly hope to achieve in the future. It's insufficient right now, but it's, uh, it's a first step. Uh, and in the future, we hope to have much more explicit ties between the goals and objectives and the operational plan and the budget. And the way that we're going to do that is through program budgeting. Right now, our budget is um, basically broken down by department and division. And that's been the way the county has always has done, that, done its budget. Uh, in the future, we want to break down the divisions into actually programs and do a true program budget uh, for, the, for the board to get into more detail. That takes a lot of work and that will be uh, coming, forthcoming, and that will allow us to more explicitly tie the objectives that are outlined in the operational plan to the budget. Now in this case, you can actually see uh, a very explicit tie between the objective and the budget, but we want more of that. We don't have that on all places, we, and we recognize that this is a first step. And then the next step, uh, after we do program level budgeting, is to do performance evaluation. And we really, um, I know there's impatience to get to that point uh, by the board, and I fully understand that, but we're not, we haven't even really begun performance evaluation. We haven't even trained our staff, uh, because again, these were huge lifts, doing our strategic plan, doing our operation plan, doing a two-year budget, were all very intensive efforts involving um, a lot of staff time. And so now the next step is to start doing um, the performance evaluation, which will start with training uh, of our staff, and then we will start doing pilot projects in the coming years. I will say that in some of our departments, they are already way ahead on this um, performance evaluation. In particular, parts of uh, the probation department, parts of the human services department, they have examples of very good performance evaluation uh, efforts. But as a county as a whole, we have really not even begun that effort and thus uh, program level budgeting tied to our operation plan and then tied to performance evaluation will be the, the way that we will be going in the future. So I wanted to talk uh, besides the process about our fiscal stewardship, uh, which the board has set as a goal and which you have uh, had many uh, achievements. Uh, over the past uh, number of years, the board has given us direction and we have tripled our reserves. Uh, we have met the board's goal of a 10% uh, reserve of revenues, which is very good and was also a big lift. Uh, we have improved our credit rating and we have reduced our pension obligations and our structural imbalance to less than 1% of expenditures. Uh, we still use some fund balance to balance our budget which is basically uh, salary savings and reversions, uh, but below 1% is actually very prudent and very, uh, and very something we should be proud of. We have also controlled employee growth. Our pre-recession workforce was over 2,600 employees and we're still below 2,500 employees. Even though we've expanded services significantly in certain areas, we still have less employees than we did um, prior to the recession 2009. We have also uh, begun to tackle deferred maintenance issues uh, with some improvements at our main facilities at Emmeline, uh, Freedom Campus, uh, Bromer Street, and here at 701 Ocean. Uh, we've had some major achievements uh, such as our solar installations, which has reduced energy costs, and our expansions of our health clinics. We've also augmented services, even though um, we have been very prudent in our use of resources and our, our, our staffing, we still have done, had some major achievements. Our, we've had programs such as the Nurse Family Partnership, Thrive by Three, the Whole Person Care Program, and Medi-Cal Drug Expansion, which have worked to improve our community well-being and health. Uh, we have responded to the needs of the homeless by expanding our shelter and working to alleviate homelessness among our youth. And we have made significant investments in our public safety needs with new facilities at Roundtree and Blaine Street and the Sobering Center, all designed to reduce recidivism and transition offenders back into our community in a positive way. So I think it's something very proud, uh, and this is just a sample. Obviously, you folks are aware of all the things that we have achieved in expanding our services. 
but I think it's something for the board to be very proud of that at the same time you've increased your reserves, you've controlled employee growth, you've also made major expansions in program services to the community. It's a big achievement and I think something we should celebrate that often we overlook, but yet it's pretty amazing what we've been able to achieve and I, the credit goes of course to our staff. I'm very proud of our staff. Uh, we have a first rate staff and I've worked in public service for over 30 years. I've worked in numerous organizations and we have a first rate staff here, I'm very proud of them. And so the idea that we've augmented services while still being very fiscally prudent is an achievement that we should all be proud of. Uh, I will now uh, turn it over to the county budget uh, manager who will go over the nitty gritty details of our budget. I know this is the exciting part that you're all looking forward to. <laughs> okay, good morning members of the board. Um, so before you is our, Jan? Oh, okay. Closer. Um, before you is, of course, the two-year bu proposed budget for 2019 through uh, 2021. Uh, presented to you today as a collective effort from the departments uh, based on our best estimates to meet the requirements for county services and programs over the next two years. Local governments throughout California face tremendous fiscal pressure, and we are very pleased to say we are not looking at any major cuts to either programs or staff as is in the case in some other jurisdictions. This budget also takes into consideration much of the community feedback we received during the strategic and operational planning process by allocating resources consistent with identified objectives as part of our 2019-21 operational plan. Oh, wrong way, sorry. Okay, and here uh, is an overview of the, the two-year budget um, the 2019-20 budget uh, consists of about $827 million with a decrease of about $45 million, primarily from an increase of $18.5 million for the general fund to maintain operations, offset by a decrease of $63.9 million for all other funds. And those are primarily from the completion of projects within the road fund, housing fund, and other capital projects. Staffing reflects an increase of 53.56 uh, uh, funded positions. And I'll go into further details in the staffing a little later. The county budget for 2021 uh, totals $771 million with a decrease of 55 million um, from 1920, uh, primarily from an increase of 11.8 million for the general fund to maintain status quo operations offset by a decrease of 67 million and anticipating the completion of various one-time projects funded again from those various other funds. Staffing reflects a uh, um, decrease of 4.75 positions and I'll go into those in further detail. So <coughs> there's four primary taxes that make up 90% of the county's discretionary revenues included in the general fund and here are the, f the revenue assumptions for the next two years based on information available today. The 2019-21 uh, proposed budget anticipates declining growth in our property taxes from 4.5% to 3.5%. Limited growth uh, in our cannabis business tax based on actuals to date and uh, growth uh, future of about 5%. Minimal growth in our sales tax. We've had seen some growth today, budget over budget, uh, which resulted in about a 4% growth for next year, um, declining to 3.5%. Um, and that the 3.5% growth in the second year is primarily, because sales tax is flattening out, it's primarily from the increased <coughs> businesses that are opening. Uh, we've had uh, changes in the Aptos Village, um, and we're anticipating some openings of some other businesses in that second year. And then of course our transient occupancy tax, our hotel tax, uh, we're anticipating about a 5% growth. And all of those support our um, estimated expenditures. So here you can see the overall general revenue trends, um, property tax, um, now that the market values have been restored um, since the recession, the growth is more modest and reliant on the CPI and sales of properties turnover. But thanks to the voters for the passage of Measure G, our half cent uh, transaction tax, an additional $7 million is available to offset increased programs of 2 million and support core services of 5 million. 
otherwise general sales tax growth is beginning to flatten out as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then the other two you can see here transient occupancy tax has shown steady growth over the past years and is expected to continue on the average of 5% per year until the recession is upon us. Cannabis business taxes have not grown as originally budgeted, which is consistent with what other jurisdictions are experiencing, including the state. As a result, we have adjusted our expectations to show minor growth, um, primarily for the dispensaries at 5%, and increasing growth for cultivation as licensing progresses. I'd like to move on to some more specific highlights for the 2019-20 uh, budget. Here you can see an overview of all the funds uh, by category. Um, revenues are 779 million with a 48 million in fund balance from other funding sources uh, for a total of the 827 million. The budget was balanced by increases to fees and charges to offset increased costs where applicable, <coughs> increases in tax revenue, primarily from our property tax growth just discussed, and the use of available fund balance. This chart represents what percentage each budget category contributes to revenues, and these revenues are derived from a variety of sources. Um, and here you can see that on the next slide. This ch chart represents where our revenues come from. The largest source of funding is about $309 million, comes from federal and state sources, primarily provided through health and human services, land use, and community services. Only 23% of the county's funding comes from taxes. Here's an overview of the total expenditures of 827 million. This reflects a decrease of about 5% from the previous fiscal year. Um, this chart represents how expenditures are distributed amongst the budget categories. Salaries and benefits are the largest expenditure of 44% um, and support the county workforce shown on the next slide. It's important to note that we only spend about 1% of our expenditures on debt service, which is very low. Here you can see the staffing um, for the funded positions by budget category. The details are provided in the appendix and the personnel summary. Proposed staffing is 2,469 plus positions. Um, it's an increase, as I mentioned earlier, of 53 positions from the current <coughs> fiscal year. It's important to note that 31.2 positions have already been added mid-year by your board um, from various uh, increased funding for the focused intervention team, expansion of homeless services, and other grant-funded programs within Health and Human Services. The increase in the net new positions is 22 positions, primarily for Health and Human Services, General Services, and Public Safety. Now I'd like to focus on the general fund overview. Um, here you can see the revenues for the general fund account for 552 million, uh, with 6.2 million provided from the general fund fund balance, which is also known as our structural imbalance or net county cost. This is an increase of about 3% from the current fiscal year. And this chart represents the ways in which each budget category contributes to the general fund revenues, which represent about 28% of the total revenues. The largest source of funding is federal and state dollars, primarily through health and human services. Here you can see the general fund expenditures of 558 million. The largest source of general fund expenditures is of course salaries and benefits and services and supplies. And then of course, here you can see our general fund contribution. So this is the, when we have, the departments have their direct revenues and their costs. And the difference for the general fund departments, we provide the general fund contribution, which comes from the general fund revenues. And we call that here the general fund contribution or net county cost, which is $162 million. These are the most discretionary dollars funded from the general fund. Um, and as you can see, we spend more than half of every dollar on public safety. Here you can see a breakdown comparing those various categories to the previous year. While revenues grew 8%, primarily from the passage of Major G, our half cent sales tax, or about seven million, total expenses once again outpaced our revenues by $6.2 million, which is funded by our prior year budget to actual savings. 
you will note that the general fund debt service is very low at only 3.4%. Without any additional borrowing, our debt service will decline over the next 10 years. Public safety is still the largest category at 54%, with a slight increase in general government and health and human services, offset by a decline in one-time capital projects, technology, and contingencies. So here we'll spend a little time looking briefly at our 2021 uh, projected budget. This chart shows the general fund imbalance between revenues and expenditures and how we rely on prior year budget savings to balance the budget. This past year we had $6.2 million, which we estimate to have again at the end of 1819 to carry forward to 1920. The majority of this savings comes from unused contingencies and one-time unanticipated reimbursements of prior year costs for various human services and other programs and some slightly better allocations from the state. The projection for 2021 reflects status quo operations with a net county cost of 12.6 million, which could be offset by 6.2 million if we achieve a similar budget savings during 1920, which will be challenging if the economy gets worse and we enter a recession. This leaves a gap of 6.4 million to reconcile if additional revenue measures like an increase to the transient occupancy tax are achieved and or some additional grant revenues are received for programs, then this gap could be reduced by 50% and be more manageable with some one-time solutions and some serious belt tightening. Looking ahead, the general fund revenue growth is anticipated to decline and we will be unable to match the estimated expenditure growth. The general fund is unlikely to meet its obligations without new or increased revenues and or major cost reductions that could potentially impact programs and services. Based on revised projections, the annual budget shortfall of six to seven million in 2021 <coughs> declines to a more manageable three to four million by 23-24. However, it could be as high as 11 to 12 million during a recession declining to $8 million if prior year savings are not achieved and general purpose revenues stagnate or decline further than projected. Since retirement rates may level out to a more modest average increase of 3% by 23-24, revenue growth could potentially cover our expenditure growth based on current operations and additional revenue increases. Of course, it's been important that we increase our reserves the past years um, because it will help us provide a softer landing during a recession. The state board goal was to increase reserves to 10% of revenues by 21-22, which we achieved with the current fiscal year budget three years ahead of schedule. Fiscal year 2019-20 reserves continue to be 10% of estimated revenues before any adjustments are accounted for as a result of budget hearings or year-end closing. Commitments include a reserve for natural disasters of $2 million, which could be used to address the winter storm 2016-17 shortfall, which we will be discussing with your board. Since fiscal year 2011-12, the county has increased reserve by $23 million to create stronger financial stability for the county's general fund and improve the county's credit rating. And I'll mention that we did provide at this time, before we make any additional adjustments, we did um, provide an increase of 2.6 million in the uh, 2019 budget to maintain that 10%. Okay. I wanted to go back and um, emphasize the point that um, the budget manager uh, just said is that our 2020 budget, 1920 is balanced. So that shows the balance there. And it's balanced largely because of Measure G. Uh, measure G about um, approximately $5 million is going into core, maintaining core services and then another uh, two to two and a half million is going into new initiatives. So if we didn't, if we didn't have Measure G, we would be experiencing a, approximately a $5 million budget deficit that we would be cutting. So that's good news that we, uh, th that our residents um, were um, able to approve Measure G 
and maintain our core services in the county. What you see in 2021, so that's the second year of the budget, is that we have a, defi a deficit um, on the best case scenario of about $6 million, and it could be much larger than that, it could be as high as 12. That's above our use of fund balance. So every year, we're using fund balance of approximately $6.2 million. That's salary savings and reversions, and we kind of count on it every year, and every year uh, we've been able to achieve it. Um, but on top of that, in 2021, we're showing another $6 million that we don't have budget reversions for, we don't have uh, salary savings for. So that is gonna be the challenge in the second year of this budget, is unless we're able to uh, bring in um, new revenue sources, we are gonna be in a cutback mode in 2021. We're gonna have to be eliminating uh, approximately $6 million of net county cost or general fund contribution, which is the most difficult um, cuts to make, as you can imagine. And if we were to have a recession, uh, it could be as high as another $12 million. So in other words, best case scenario, we have a deficit of about $6 million in the second year of the budget. Worst case scenario, you get another, you get up to $12 million, which would be very difficult, very challenging um, cut cuts to make. And this is uh, something that is still uh, under the best case scenario. We're still projecting uh, growth in our property tax, grow, as um, the budget manager pointed out, we are still anticipating growth in sales tax, growth in property tax, growth in TOT. Uh, even with that growth, our expenditures are outpacing. Uh, in a recession, you would see that growth in those revenue, those key revenue sources decline uh, greatly. And so that's why that worst case scenario, you get out to um, $12 million or more deficit. You can see that uh, although that the second year of this budget is gonna be difficult, um, that after that, it actually probably gets better. And that is largely because some of the costs for PERS increases, retirement costs, actually level out and and then actually way out, um, start actually declining, not in, not in this picture, but they're basically starting to level out and decrease the rate of increase. And so, anyway, it's something to keep in mind. I just wanted to reemphasize that for the board as we get into this budget. This year, we have a balanced budget, uh, largely due to Measure G, um, but next year will be challenging, and depending on what happens with the economy, it could be worse. I wanted to talk briefly about our, our challenges. Um, uh, we have uh, some challenges in each of these areas, parks and recreation, behavior, behavioral health, substance use disorders, and then uh, deferred maintenance and roads, storm drains, and bridges. Uh, we have had a significant investment of new resources in behavioral health and substance use disorders from the federal and state governments, and this board has also made significant investments using Measure G funds, a big chunk of the money, Measure G money uh, that came in, you set aside for this, and so even though we have a challenge there, we've also put in a new resources. Parks and Recreation has historically been underfunded uh, in this county as in many jurisdictions, and the board set aside a big part of Measure G funds to help improve Parks and Recreation, and so even though we've made advances, we still fa face challenges in Parks and Recreation. Roads, storm drains, and bridges, um, Measure D, uh, which the voters approved a few years ago, which is half cent sales tax, as well as um, the gas tax, SB1, have put significant new resources and we're starting to see improvements in that area, but the storm drains, the storm storms and storm drain problems that we've had um, have um, led to more problems in our roads and storm, and storm drains and bridges. And then we have the ongoing problem of just deferred maintenance in our facilities, which we don't really have any funding source. So in the other three areas, uh, the board, the voters have put in new resources. We're making progress. We still have significant challenges. But in deferred maintenance, we really don't have any new resources. And those are things like our county jail, like this building, the elevators, and the, the HVAC system. We had our HVAC system go out a few days ago during our board meeting. We had our elevator go out. It's just a good example. We had a water leak at MLI, and it seems like we have one every few months and it's just the aging of our buildings that we haven't invested in, like many jurisdictions, and so that's a continuing process that we'll need to look at. 
So in closing, um, our costs are rising faster than our revenues, and especially we notice it in the second year of this budget. We worry about a recession approaching. Um, they ha there's a housing shortage, which causes all sorts of stresses in the community. And then uh, most significantly for us is our winter storm shortfall. Uh, the public works director um, will be uh, talking about this in depth at, during his presentation, but it is a significant problem in that many of the costs that we had from the winter storm of a few years ago, uh, 2016 seven and 17, uh, we are worried about what amount we are actually gonna get reimbursed by the federal uh, government and we've seen um, difficulties in getting those reimbursements from the federal government and then the disaster funding. So that is a very significant challenge and I know we're gonna talk about that more in depth during the Public Works Department budget. We have some opportunities. Um, there's a potential um, to raise our transient occupancy tax. Uh, many jurisdictions, uh, two of them in our, our own county are now at 12%. Um, there's some jurisdictions in Santa Clara and Monterey County that have gone up to 14%. Our, our 911 fee is outdated and we need to update that to modernize it. That's another opportunity. And then we've been looking at the possibility of going to the voters at NCSA 48 for county fire to see if there would be a willingness to increase funding for that agency as well, that part of our, our agency. Uh, we also are very good at leveraging grants and public-private partnerships. We sent you some good news about Prop 47 for the community, which is huge. Uh, it's amazing, $7 million of resources coming in to this community, as well as other grants that we've been aware of. Uh, we have reserves that we could use somewhat if we needed to, and we are gonna look at that as an opportunity for some of the storm-damaged uh, roads, possibly using some of our, a small amount of reserves for that. And then the other thing is that uh, the county has been very conservative and prudent in its use of debt. Uh, we have less than 1% of our um, revenues going to debt service, which is very, very low and very prudent. It's a good thing, uh, but there's, there's opportunities there in the future as well. Most agencies are more in the three to 5%, and that's generally considered, 5% would be considered prudent and, and good, and we're in the 1%, so Anyway, congratulations to the board in the past over <coughs> of having that, but that is another opportunity in the future. So uh, we will continue working on the operational plan and two-year budget, continuous process improvement, performance measurement. You're gonna see a major initiative in the coming year with training and new pilots coming out for that. And then we are urging, of course, the board to continue as you have in the past uh, to show fiscal restraint and expand when we can, um, but also be aware of the challenging, challenges and opportunities that are facing that. With that, that brings our presentation to a close, and I know the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector had a few words, and then we will be uh, open for any questions on the budget overview. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. As you begin a week of budget hearings, I have a few brief remarks to make. Overall, the county's fiscal message is a positive one. This is due to our high bond ratings, our low interest rate costs, and the achievement of the 10% reserve goals as set by your board to maintain strong county fiscal health. The county's short-term ratings was reviewed this month by both Standard & Poor's and Moody's rating agencies. We received the highest rating available. This continues the county's history of strong bond ratings. Our long-term ratings have remained unchanged. S&P has awarded us a AAA rating and Moody's an AA3 rating. On Wednesday, the county sold short-term bonds with a low interest rate cost to us of only 1.19%. Regarding the county's fiscal reserves, your board adopted and met a reserve goal of 10%. This action reflects your board's dedication to invest in the future. This will become even more important in the next year, as many economists are predicting a recession or some significant slowing of the economy by the end of 2021. If this happens, maintaining our reserves may be a difficult yet important fiscal management step. With economic uncertainties ahead of the county, I urge you to continue your practice of maintaining spending restraints during this budget hearing. Thank you, and that concludes my report. <coughs> Thank you. We'll open it up for questions now. Supervisor Friend. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I actually just have one brief uh, question that in, is in regards to the sort of best worst case scenario in regards to uh, the six or 12 million or moving forward. You presented the possibility of three potential revenue measures of which one I would assume would be directly tied to the general fund, the TOT. The best case scenario though, I assume was in regards to the current projections absent those revenue measures, correct? That okay. is correct, then, yes. And what, what would be a best case scenario should one, two, or three of these revenue measures uh, pass that we would actually have a sense then of, of where these numbers would go? Do you want to answer that? Or want sure. To? So for every 1% increase in the transient occupancy tax, we realize about a million dollars. Um, so depending on the level of the increase. Um, currently 911, our outdated 911 fee doesn't take into account uh, cell phones. And so we've lost considerable amount of revenue to support that. So the general fund is supporting that to the tune of, of close to over a million dollars. So if we were able to right size that fee, we could save a million dollars there. And um, county fire doesn't benefit the general fund, but we know we want to expand our county fire services. So, so you would estimate maybe a, a, up to three million uh, potentially, recognizing though that if a recession were to happen at the same time, people travel less, and so this isn't a one for one, but, but uh, you, we would still be faced in a best case scenario, even with res revenue measures, the reality of cutting potentially three plus million dollars in the next couple of years? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, the, the, uh, the one thing I was trying to um, figure out it, around the sales tax increases, um, I, these numbers uh, seem to uh, jibe with other uh, figures that I've seen. Uh, but when we looked at the public works budget and the Measure D, there was no growth at all. Uh, and I'm wondering, is it, they I said they were being conservative, but are we are we not uh, uh, including resources that could be available for things that, that the public considers to be very important? So we have been advised, I mean, we are seeing growth budget over budget, and that growth is already occurring this year. Um, but actually, the, the actual sales taxes is fairly close to flat, the growth, the future growth. So they may be, um, depending on how they budgeted this year, um, if they budgeted the full amount that they expected for Measure D, um, then they may look fairly flat for the coming years. Yeah, I'm, so I'm just trying to figure out if we say that we ex that, that this budget mm -hmm. anticipates a 4% growth, mm -hmm. right? I, it's I, actually less than 2%. We are actually already s seeing and receiving about 2.5% of that 4% growth because it's budget to budget. So our estimates uh, in our current year, we're already seeing an additional 2.5% above budget. Okay, uh, I was just uh, responding sure. to the to the numbers that were up here earlier, right. and then at the three and a half in in year two, and just it, it seems to me that we should have a, a common standard, I mm -hmm. guess, uh, across uh, departments, um, and when we make these kind of uh, 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 budget suggestions, uh, because I think it's it's helpful for us to be mm -hmm. using if we're going to be conservative, expect <laughs> that, but we should be conservative across the board, and if we're going to uh, anticipate uh, growth. We should be. We should anticipate that across the board. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate the work that, that you put into this. I guess one thing with the Measure D versus our sales tax. Measure D is a countywide um, sales tax versus our own sales tax was just the unincorporated area, and I know that Measure D uh, incorporates some of the. It's of course the cities, and there are some cities that are actually seen declines in sales tax, mm -hmm. like Capitola, which is actually declining because of the mall uh, closure. And we are, we're actually growing largely, um, some of it is due to uh, Aptos Village. We're anticipating some of the growth there. Great, so President Pearson. Yeah, I'd like to make several comments. Um, first of all, for uh, very uh, enlightening, but uh, at the same time challenging uh, budget scenario that you've presented. Uh, this, uh, really what you've done is, uh, amounts to a, um, a milestone in good governance and transparency for Santa Cruz County. Uh, I look at this budget and can even understand it. And I think most of the people in Santa Cruz County can too, and I want to really say thank you to you and all the staff. Uh, when we're evaluating a, a two-year budget, uh, it's, it's really easy to understand. And um, under the strategic plan and the operational plan, um, 
I want to say thank you to all of your staff, as you have done too, um, especially I think to Nicole Coburn and Sven Stafford. Um, and I want to thank them for uh, seeing me to look at uh, to, uh, to in the operational plan to add something to address the needs of senior citizens in our county that um, is very important, especially in light of Governor Newsom um, ordering a master plan on aging uh, to be developed by next year in October. So I think it's really important that we are on, in line with that. Um, and the, the fiscal discipline, uh, it can't be overstated. I think that is really a great. We're ho hopefully we don't have, we're not gonna need it this year, but uh, next year is gonna really be a challenge as you have stated. Um, and the spending or having only 1% debt service is um, really somewhat remarkable um, it, for government agency. Um, I can't, I wanna um, reiterate too with the, the help of county voters, uh, we've made some great strides toward addressing uh, some of our future needs that we, we need to do so with measures G uh, and D and also the library measure um, um, M uh, or no S, excuse S. me, S. Measure S that, um, and, um, and that was in 2016, but um, in making um, investments in our roads and infrastructure, I think our biggest challenge, as you said, we don't have a support system for our maintenance. And um, as much as we all wanna add something and do something more, we, we need to really uh, focus on maintaining our, our own uh, buildings and so forth, and I'm not saying that because half this room is full with uh, maintenance uh, workers in, in the county right now, but um, it'll cost us more if we don't address it uh, right away. Um, also that we know that um, our PERS costs are gonna be going up. I think it's um, um, gonna be leveling. It's gonna be a tough year next year uh, and maybe the year after, but uh, hopefully they'll level off and uh, will help us to get to that, uh, to address that. Um, six and a half, six and point four million dollar shortfall. But uh, overall, I just want to say thank you for presenting an un understandable budget and one that uh, looks very good. And we just have to keep our wits about us to make sure that we are ready for what's about to come with a recession that everybody is predicting sometime. Um, we, we are in good shape, I think, to do that. And I want to thank you again for everything that you have presented today. Mr. Caput. I want to thank you all for your work too. This is uh, uh, this is, you know probably one of the most important things we do in the whole year. As far as uh, if we make one mistake, we're we're all going to suffer for it. I guess all the decimal points are in the right spot. I mean, I remember a few years back when I was on a uh, library board that one decimal point was off and uh, one part of the county was uh, actually facing uh, about a five million dollar deficit or whatever so uh, and I think that happened with the state of California too and, uh, but that's bigger money so anyway uh, with the staffing it's increased uh, that came by real quick uh, it's uh, we're up to it'll be at about 2,470, uh, and what was it uh, two years ago? Two years ago? Um, approximately, I don't mean Approximately, that. well we increased the staffing this year about 50 positions, and the previous year we increased the staffing a very small amount, um, about 20 some positions, so less than 100. It was, it was about 2,000, 250 or something like that. Yeah, closer closer to the 2300 mark, yes. And I, I bring that up because that's a future t uh, possibly pension obligations that we'll have. And uh, uh, kind of a quick overview, in the last uh, four years, three, four years, we've done what to take some of the, uh, to address the uh, pension uh, problem that faces everybody, uh, you know, down the line. I, I know some of yeah. it is uh, yeah, what, your, more your contribution your from all of us. Yes, there's uh, been a number in, of initiatives to reduce pension costs. Uh, you, the board uh, took action um, to provide a third tier for, or a second tier rather, uh, for retirement, which was, um, we 
um, increase the age of retirement. This board did uh, for new employees. This is a number of years ago, actually. Um, so you established the second tier. You also adopted a vesting schedule for retiree health benefits according to years of service. And then after that, the state of California adopted pension reform, which in effect established a third tier uh, for our employees. So the first tier was for general employees was 2% at 55. Then the board adopted a second tier, 2% at 60 for new employees. And then there was a third tier established by the state of California was 2% at 62. And, and then in addition, you adopted a vesting schedule for retiree health benefits. Um, in addition, uh, employees, you've worked with our em labor groups so that employees now contribute more uh, towards their own pension, and that's taken place over the years. So employees um, pay their own share of, of retiree health, or, um, of health benefits and of uh, pension benefits, and that amount has increased over the years. So all of those things are good news in the future, um, but right now we're still in the last part of the prior benefits, and that's why it's costing more right now. But the future actually looks quite hopeful because of these reforms. You bet. Okay, and then uh, uh, total uh, total reserves. Uh, there'll be some one-time spending on on that, right? Uh, and uh, what is, what is the total about? How many million that we have in reserve? Looking to the auditor, it's over. It's close to fifty-five million. Close to what? Fifty-five million, 55 million. is the uh, total reserves. Yes. Uh, and, and after the one time, it would go down to how much? It'll if if your board takes action on using some of the uh, commitments for natural disasters to fund the uh, storm uh, fund shortfalls, uh, it would reduce um, the reserves by approximately two million, or up to about two million. About how much? Less. Three. Two million. Two million. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> the other one, uh, how much of a stress is the federal highway uh, money that's supposed to come in? I think it was approximately seven to eight million dollars. And if they're not giving anything, I mean, so we're, we're, having, uh, we're having to shuffle everything in order to cover about, what, seven to eight million dollars? Yes, uh, the um, public works director will go over this in, in more detail, but the summary is that there's about $7 million of storm damage roads that the county repaired in an emergency basis for which we did not get reimbursed from a combination of federal highways and FEMA. And that totals about approximately $7 million. And that shortfall is something that we are going to have to make up with. And we have a proposal to do that, which we'll be bringing uh, forward. Um, and you'll be talking about it during the D Department of Public Works budget. Is that included in the what we're looking at now? It's not another seven million we're going to have to take out later. No, it's uh, we have a plan for that, and it will be addressed during the Public Works Department budget. Uh, that'll be in the next day or two. Yes. Okay. And let's see what do we got here. Staffing. Uh, the, uh, from the budget of uh, this year and next year projected, uh, there's about a difference of a uh, $19 million increase uh, in the general, and that would be mostly due to staff increase maybe, huh? And, uh, and also a little bit of inflation and colas and everything. Yeah, there are staffing increases in there. We've also added uh, new programs. Um, so we've augmented uh, various programs uh, thanks to Major G. So there's various other new services and programs included in that 18 and a half million. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. <clears throat> Thank you for a, both a clear budget and a responsible budget that both um, <clears throat> addresses emerging needs in our community and uh, is fiscally responsible. Uh, calling attention to what you said earlier, which is this is our first two-year budget. Um, so one of the goals of the two-year budget was not only to give people some sense as to um, where things were going, uh, have a broader time scale. The second one was to free up some staff resources who spend 
many, many months preparing this budget to spend time on performance management and those other things. Uh, I know it's early because uh, we're just getting this budget in, but uh, how um, are, are those resources going to be available to look at um, other projects and to, to free up uh, capacity um, for more analysis and performance management? Um, that is our intent, yes. Um, it, depending on what happens in that second year, you know, it could be if there's major changes in the budget, we'll have to have more extensive work. Uh, but our intent is to focus really just on the changes in that second year to what we've already submitted to you um, and to focus more on some of the new performance measurement as it ties to the operational budget. So that's what our hope is. Uh, because it is a huge, I mean, this document is is huge, <laughs> and this is just one piece of it, right? There's all the line item detail, and there's all the, the supplemental, and it's a big effort to produce, just to produce it. And so the idea is that by not having to produce the same amount of uh, effort, we will able to devote more to our performance measurement uh, and continuous process improvement efforts. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, one, another thing I wanted to thank you for, you... Um, you count, you're expected to, we expect to have you have a six month review of this. Is that gonna be at the first of the year in January? Is that correct with this budget? I think that's that's excellent. That gives us a heads up as we're going along. Um, really, we're, you know, they talk about this recession and it could start in six months, it could be in six years. But I think having that, um, you know, mid-year review is really important and I really wanna thank you for, for doing that for us too. It's gonna be very important so we can prepare for anything that might come up. We actually have uh, instituted two um, previews, one in um, late November or December to summarize uh, the close of the prior fiscal year as well as what trends we're looking at. And then we have a formal mid-year budget review in February. Great. Uh, so now is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items on today's, uh, or just covered by this item. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to speak to us? about the overview of uh, opening remarks and the proposed budget. Okay, seeing none, I'll close it and I'll bring it back to item number six, which is an overview of the general government budget category. There's a presentation on general government budget category as provided in the proposed budget. And these are pages uh, 45 to 47 as outlined in the memorandum of the CAO. Good morning again, members of the board, Christina yeah. Mowry. I'll be presenting this item and providing you an overview of the general government category. So here you can see a list of the departments included in the general government uh, category, <coughs> everything from the assessor, auditor, controller, to personnel, information services, general services, um, of course our office, the county administrative office, and then we have, uh, we've included our financing um, from the general county revenues, debt service and contingencies, as well as contributions to AMBAG. And here you'll see an overview of the general government expenditure category. Uh, represents about $102 million for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, this represents 12% of the total budget expenditures for fiscal year 1920 and is a 1% decrease from the previous fiscal year which is primarily due to the increased uh, cost of, to maintain current operations, offset by some one-time decreases for the internal service funds, like information services and risk management. This chart shows the share of expenditures by department and agency. The largest expenditure, of course, is salaries and benefits, which comprises about $45 million uh, and supports about 320 positions. Uh, with an increase overall of one position from the previous fiscal year. Additional expenditures include services and supplies of about 40 million and 32 million in other charges. Here you can see the expenditures by type for the two fiscal years. The majority of the funding, of course, is for salaries and benefits and supports the um, 300 plus funded positions for fiscal year 1920 and 310 positions for fiscal year fiscal year 2021. Um, there you can see the services and supplies at 41 million rising to 42 million in the second year and other charges. 
It's important to note you see the major shift in other charges there. That's where we budget for our risk management funds, claims reserves. So they budget their reserves and appropriations, and that's why we see the major shift in the overall category there. Here you'll see the revenues uh, for the general government. Um, it's comprised of about 54 million this year, or about 53% of their total financing, uh, with the general fund contributions and other funds making up the difference of 47% um, to meet the expenditure needs. The general government uh, revenues represent 7% of the total budgeted revenues, um, and is comprised of about 50 million in charges for services, and 2.9 million in miscellaneous, and seven, uh, less, than, less than a million in licenses and permit fees. Additional financing includes 24 million in the general fund contribution, and 24 million in other funds, which is primarily our risk management funds. This chart shows the share of financing by department and agency, and uh, note that both the AMBAG and the Board of Supervisors are not represented here. Um, since they are fully supported by the general fund, they have no revenues. Um, risk management is the largest share of general government at 38%, primarily because the risk management reserves include the uh, various reserves for the various funds. Here you can see the revenues by type for the two fiscal years. The majority of the revenue is from charges for services, at, at almost 50 million, and in 2019-20, uh, and an increase of uh, 52 million for 2021 to offset the rising costs. And here you'll see the general fund contribution for each of the departments and agencies. Um, the total is $24 million, which represents 14% of the total general fund uh, net county cost or contribution and the further details are provided in each of the budget proposals from the departments. The general government departments contributed 61 objectives for the 1921 operational plan. Major projects include mobilizing for the 2020 census, creating a strategy to reduce fleet emissions, and several continuous improvement projects to create a better experience for the county residents. And here you can see some of our, our highlights and our successes. Um, personnel department organized the county's first career fair with 100% county departments represented, 410 job seekers in attendance, and 110 attendees at three different workshops. Um, the clerk elections office reduced the record setting uh, November 2018 election. They saw the highest voter turnout since 1982 and offered three same day registration centers across the county and installed and promoted two more vote by mail drop boxes to allow voters to return their vote by mail ballots with greater ease. Of course, Measure G passed. We are very fortunate to have that pass and support our core services and new programs. And in general services, the fleet division increased its uh, fleet, hybrid fleet by three vehicles for a total of 75 alternative fuel vehicles. The county administrative office, as you just heard, has um, produced the first two-year budget and operational plan, and we've begun PRIMO. Oops. Oh, and that's, uh, well, I, let me go back. Wasn't quite done. Um, and uh, the Office of Economic Development created and launched a new Office of Economic Development website, Santa Cruz Vitality, to promote a compelling value proposition and brand for Santa Cruz County. And our department heads are here today to answer any of your questions. Um, uh, the majority of them are on consent agenda. And then we have four departments presenting their budgets in detail to you, general services, personnel services, information services, and of course the county administrative office. So with that, I'll turn it over to see if you have any questions. Otherwise, we can. Do we have any questions about the general government budget category? Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, I, um, as a member of AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, I, I really thank you, um, Maura Tomey, of, uh, the Executive Director of AMBAG, for her staff and doing a terrific job of tracking big issues that affect our region. Um, I especially appreciate uh, AMBAG keeping its members informed regarding state and federal 
regulations that could have a serious impact, and unfortunately we heard last week that there could be a serious one coming uh, upon us. Uh, we heard how the federal rollback of national fuel eff efficiency standard for vehicles could have a, a disastrous effect on California. Uh, in its greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction goals, uh, and uh, the ability to deliver more than 130 billion for that purpose. So it's a real big concern. We have uh, transportation-related concerns in our own county, but uh, this is a regional area too, which of course we are one of the three counties with San Benito and Monterey. Um, I'd just like to ask a couple questions um, for some of the members that are here um, in the general services that we've talked to. Um, on the cannabis um, licensing, initially we assumed that uh, the fees would generate a high revenue, which weren't attained, and that's true throughout the state of California. Um, and we need to move more, as we have been doing, to um, make this uh, self-sufficient operation if we can. And if I could ask um, uh, some 40 of, um, if we are reducing a planner position in this, uh, as called for in the budget, are we going to be able to process the uptick we hope to see in the applications for this? Um, I don't know if anybody from here from cannabis operations could answer that. Uh, yes, I can, I yeah, can answer that and I'll see if, if they want to come in and um, I know they're monitoring the, the hearings in their offices. Uh, we are, uh, the budget is proposing to uh, to have one position which is unfunded. We still have the position. Um, our uh, staff felt that, them, that they are able in the Cannabis Licensing Office to process applications at this time with the staffing they have. Uh, the issue has been more in the planning side where we've devoted more resources in the planning uh, department to this effort. So uh, Cannabis life is Licensing feels that at this point we are able to manage it. But we still have the position there, and if we see an uptick and we need to bring another position back, we will. Okay. Um, another question to be directed to our county clerk, our excellent county clerk, uh, Gail Pellerin. Uh, last week, or just recently, you talked about uh, our election system being decertified, de but we got a grant for doing that and uh, to update our election systems. And what does that mean? Is that any difference, what differences can the voter in March of next year expect to see, if any? Or um, I know that you explained it somewhat uh, a week ago, but I think this is a good time to repeat that. And it would be state money that would be coming in to help us pay for the lease of the new voting system. And what voters would see is basically it's all going to be paper-based, as we want to continue to do. And we're staying with the same vendor we have now, so it's basically just an upgrade of our current system. And it's on the paper ballots, instead of connecting the head and tail. Is that my Oh, there you go. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> so on the paper ballots, instead of connecting the head and tail, the arrow pointing to your choice, it's going to be a bubble. So it's a little more intuitive for voters as well. The accessible unit's going to look like a large tablet, and it would allow a voter to vote independently and privately. And it will print off a paper record with the choices written um, clearly out, um, enumerated there what they're voting for. And then it has a QR code that gets read by the scanner. Okay. So, and then I'll be, we're doing those voting uh, demos this week, so I wanna invite the public and you as well to go to the demo we have set up for county staff on Thursday. And uh, we'll have it one in the morning from 10 to 12, and then six to eight over at Simpkins, and then Friday we'll be over in Watsonville Civic from 10 to 12 demonstrating the new voting system. So this will be a first glimpse. There'll be lots of other opportunities to look at it, but um, we're doing that this week prior to hopefully having the contract before you on June 25th. I know County Council's working with us on that, so thank you. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, and what, I have a, one, another question uh, directed to economic development. The, uh, the budget continues to provide uh, time for implementing project, but doesn't really include any services for supplies uh, to help fund the expenses. Uh, will that hamper the economic development department's ability to meet its objectives of new projects throughout the county? Um, good morning, board. Um, no, it won't. Uh, certainly we would welcome any additional funding uh, that could be provided. But I think that when we look at what we've done so far, which is staff time, uh, we've been successful in, in most cases. What 
additional funding could bring to the table would be opportunities to advance um, additional analysis through consultants and in particular for Boulder Creek, we could help, I think, further facilitate the advancement of the uh, uh, Boulder Creek Main Street program, which would, uh, we could, for example, we could back fund some of the cost of hiring a, um, a consultant or a Main Street program manager for that, that area. Okay, thank you. You bet. Any other questions or comments? Are we, uh, are these comments about the consent, we're gonna do the consent agenda next. So Correct, so. yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so is there any uh, public comment on the uh, overview of general government? Seeing none, I'll, uh, I guess we'll move on to item number seven, which is the action on the consent agenda the, and general government. These are items 12 through 23 uh, on, our, on our agenda today. Um, and at first I'll ask if any board members have any questions or comments or like to pull any item. Okay, seeing none, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, when we ch switch to the consent agenda, a portion of our budget hearing process, we lose the opportunity to hear about what's going on in critical departments but are somehow deemed not large enough or, or, or significant enough for us to have, to spend time hearing presentations. I appreciate the work done by these departments every day and the fact that you also answered a lot of questions that, uh, that we sent down as part of our budget memo. Um, of these, I just wanna acknowledge the ongoing work of the Assessor Recorder's Office, who I think does uh, fantastic work and, and uh, we count on in such a critical way uh, to be able to, to figure out where our money is gonna be coming from and uh, in which the public counts on. So thank you for that ongoing work. Uh, the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector uh, provides also critical work. Uh, I noticed that one of the um, uh, strategic goals is to is try to make sure that, the, that uh, we are capturing all the uh, TOT revenue from vacation rentals. Um, uh, I look forward to a, a, the annual report we get from planning about to get an idea of of uh, how many we have in, in different parts of the county. Uh, but I know that your work ongoing and the, the fact that, that you've been helpful uh, to, uh, to us in achieving uh, the goal of the reserves, uh, the, the support from your office and the ongoing work to ensure that we get the, the best rating possible is, has to do with the presentation that you put together. So uh, thank you for that. Um, the Board of Supervisors agenda is part of this and uh, I, I just want to recognize Jillian Ritter, uh, who uh, is the, the captain of our uh, Board of Supervisors uh, staff. Um, uh, she does an incredible job. Uh, we are grateful to, to have her, and I appreciate all the work she does in supporting us uh, every day in the Board of Supervisors office. Uh, some of the other, these other d departments we hear from uh, quite a bit. We spend a lot of time talking about cannabis. Uh, and the, the Cannabis Licensing Office is, is doing ongoing good work, and I'm sure we'll see you before the board on a regular basis over the next couple of years. Uh, the, as mentioned about the, at the Elections Office, uh, also uh, outstanding work in clean elections here, uh, and our recent update of our election ordinance was uh, useful and part of the ongoing work that you do to make sure that we're doing the best we can. And County Council, of course, uh, we, uh, we depend on you and the leadership that we, uh, that we get from uh, our county council, Dana McRae, but the ongoing work of all the attorneys makes a huge difference. Uh, lastly, I'll just uh, express my appreciation to the Office of Economic Development. There is a lot of economic activity going on in the first district, and uh, I, I've been able to count on our economic development staff to provide good information to me uh, to my staff that I can share with the public. I appreciate the way that they're working with businesses in the district. Um, I think uh, we're gonna be, we're, we're seeking to strengthen our economic uh, base here in Santa Cruz and I believe we have the right staff to do it. So I just wanna acknowledge that ongoing work. Great. Um, <clears throat> is there any public comment on the consent agenda today? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Sure. This is 
Is your, uh, is your, uh, <laughs> We're on the consent right now, right? Correct. And uh, most everything I was gonna ask was already answered by uh, the, the last list of uh, questions. Uh, number 21, uh, debt service. Is that, is that our debt? Uh, and is it, cause some, some people in the county are back, you know, they're behind on their uh, property tax and all that. Is that included in there too? The, no, that's just, just the, our the debt. county debt service on previous um, and funding then, certificates of participation funding sure. for various improvements in the county. And I should have asked you this before, but how close are we to paying off the debt that uh, from the 19, I think 96 uh, flood, uh, uh, the flood year we had, we we had to take a mortgage out on the county building. Uh, how are we doing on that? About how many more years <laughs> are we going to have to pay that back? You know, I'd have to look at that. It's in the debt service schedules in the appendix, and I'm happy to get you that answer. Off the top of my head, I don't know how many years okay. are left, but I know that each year we're, every couple of years we're paying off various debt issues. Yeah, uh, I think the original debt was what, about 26 million? No. Okay. Yes, I, I believe it's uh, eight years remaining. That's what. Uh, oh, sounds good. Me and the county council, that's what we think yeah. is the well, right answer. I remember us saying, in less than, in less than 10 years, we'll be uh, two thirds of the debt will be gone yes. from right. the county, mm -hmm. assuming we take on no new debt. So we're in, a, we're in a, knowing that we only spend 1% of our budget on debt service and knowing that within 10 years, two thirds of that will be gone, um, gives us an opportunity to think about the future in a different way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd entertain a motion. Got a motion by Friend and a second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, we are now going to recess to our uh, evening session tonight. We have a 7 p.m. No, no, we have regular. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> nice try. I know, I really, really, really <laughs> wanted to get going. Mr. Bowling would have gotten into exactly. his suit for no good reason. Exactly. <laughs> <coughs> um, so sorry, this is, I don't have a regular agenda from me. Uh, 12, I think. Uh, eight? Or no. Eight. Yeah, eight. eight. All right, eight, 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 eight. eight. Um, sorry, this is uh, the General Services Department, uh, and uh, it's to consider 1921 budget uh, for the General Services Department and schedule the final approval of items on the continuing uh, agreement list. Items for the last day budget hearings of June 25th as outlined in the reference, uh, reference budget documents in the memorandum of the General Services Director. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Board, Chair Coonerty. Uh, with me today uh, at the podium is Carol Johnson, Assistant Director, and uh, I am Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Uh, before we get started today, I really want to give a big thank you to the CAO's office uh, and County Council for their great support of general services over these last year. Um, this is my first full year as director, moving from the assistant director from the health services agency over this uh, past year. Uh, it has absolutely, absolutely been an amazing year, getting to know this department, getting to know every single staff member. It has been a year of learning and enjoyment for me, both personally and professionally. Um, and with that, uh, the team of GSD has really made me feel like a family member uh, within GSD. Uh, what we have here is a picture of our uh, holiday crew, uh, holiday party that we had this last uh, December? Yes, uh, December. This last December. Uh, kind of uh, about half of our GSD department is in this picture, if not m almost more than half are in this picture. Um, today, we're gonna be going over uh, the general services department and I'm a little happy today because uh, in the past, general services has been a consent item. So this is our first time in about three or four years. Yes. Uh, coming to the board to do a presentation. Now, with GSD, one thing I did learn about the GSD family is what GSD actually stands for. Uh, I originally thought it meant General Services Department, but it doesn't. It stands for Getting Stuff Done. And it is a slogan that I learned uh, right around the same time of this holiday party. And it's something that I, uh, uh, we keep coining and keep using. And uh, every time we get something done, it's like, yep, 
getting stuff done. So uh, it's something I'm kind of happy with uh, as far as we're heading that way. Um, own overview for GSD, uh, we consist of County Office of Emergency Services, the County Fire Budget, as well as the General Services Budget. Today we're going to be going over the General Services Budget with the County Fire Budget and the uh, Office of Emergency Services being on Thursday. For the General Services Budget, we are comprised of primarily uh, the Facilities Management Team, uh, which consider, consists of our Custodial Division and our Building Maintenance. Uh, we have purchasing. Uh, we also manage the county's warehouse, uh, the county's fleet related to purchasing vehicles um, and maintenance of the vehicles, and, the, and uh, energy management, construction management, and 24-7 handling of emergencies. Uh, the crew behind us that you see here today uh, is the crew that handles the 24-7 emergencies that we have in our buildings. Every time we have a flood in the middle of the night, the guys behind us uh, report. Um, the flood that we had at 1020, we had Brian Backer. Oh, where's Brian? Oh, <laughs> Brian Backer report saying that we had a huge flood at 1020, it involved about 1,000 square feet. Uh, but these are things that we redo every day. We have somebody on call constantly reporting to instances in the county where we have an emergency. And it's really this crew behind us that uh, uh, has done an excellent job on stepping up to the plate to really uh, take care of this county the best way possible related to our facilities and with the deferred maintenance that we do have. For general services, our operational plan focus areas kind of consist of our focus on sustainable environment related to energy management and some of our decisions that we do with fleet and purchasing vehicles and our construction. Uh, as well as reliable transportation, also related to our fleet, and county operational excellence. So with that, with general services, I uh, want to pass it over for a general budget overview for our assistant director, Carol Johnson. Good morning. <coughs> what you are looking at here is a snapshot of our recommended budget, which includes, in summary, an increase of expenditures of approximately 422000 an increase in offsetting revenues of 287,000, reduction in fund balance from fleet of 143,000, and an increase in general fund contribution for fiscal year 1920 of approximately 278,000. We anticipate purchasing 25 vehicles in the upcoming year, the majority of which will be sheriffs and undercover vehicles, but I'm happy to say that the, um, those purchases will also include two additional EV vehicles, which will give us a total of six in the general services fleet and adds to our current 75 uh, hybrid vehicles. This is just a summary of our 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021 20, budgets showing revenues, general fund, and expenditures. We'll all have a couple of upcoming slides that will go into more depth what makes up those revenues and expenditures. What I'd like to highlight on this slide is the staffing. In 1819, we have a total staff of 60 with two and a half positions being unfunded for a funded staffing of 57 and a half. The exciting thing, and I'd like to thank the CAO's office and uh, Trish Daniels for helping us um, add to that. So in 1920, we have the addition of a maintenance plumber to our facilities division. We have also funded a uh, senior building equipment mechanic, so we'll have quicker response to emergencies or just increased preventive maintenance on our aging equipment. We have also funded one and a half custodial positions, which will help us keep up with the expanding clinic operations both in North and South County. The, um, in 2021, you'll see that the positions drop to 58. We have three limited term positions currently which have assisted with the remodel here at the Government Center. Those positions are set to expire at the end of uh, 2020, but we hope working with the CAO's office that we can either extend those limited term positions or build them into permanent positions. This is a summary of our revenue breakdown for uh, compares 1819 to 1920 and 2021. Use of money is generally the rent we receive from the legislative office. Charges for services is primarily our uh, time and materials, fuel for our fleet division, as well as charges to um, non-general fund departments, county overhead, 
and uh, fleet and depreciation charges. Other financing is operating transfers primarily within our fleet division. So departments, if they need an additional vehicle, will offer to, to pay for that vehicle, transfer the money to fleet, and we will uh, purchase that vehicle on their behalf. The, that's good. So on, similar to the revenue, this is just a summary of our expenditure breakdowns. As you can see, salaries and benefits are primarily um, our highest costs, and the 1920 and 21, 2021 numbers include the negotiated increases. Services and supplies is our ongoing maintenance for the building. It also includes utilities. Um, other charges, county overhead. Interfund transfers, so in general services, we bill out a lot of what we do for services to other departments, and those costs or those revenues offset our salaries and benefits as well as our services and supplies. Just to highlight again some of the additional staffing that we will see in 1920. In 1819, we funded the previously unfunded deputy director position. Some of those duties we envision being the daily oversight and management of the general services department, working to achieve our um, operational objectives. We have 10 to accomplish over the next two years between general services and the Office of Emergency Services, uh, participating in the campus and facilities master plan, as well as continuing to investigate opportunities to expand our EVs, as well as the EV charging stations, which is one of general services key objectives. For the building construction project manager, which was previously the building maintenance superintendent, this position will uh, manage the many construction projects that occur through general services. We see um, an increase in those due to the adoption of CUPCA. So we'll be doing more project management at a lower cost level. They will also investigate other energy efficiency opportunities, as well as for those projects that we have implemented with energy savings, making sure that we're meeting <coughs> those um, thresholds, we're achieving the savings that we said that we would when we initially, you know, the LEDs, the solar, making sure that those savings are actually achieved, and if not, why not, and working to achieve them. Um, again, we are very happy that we've added a maintenance plumber that brings us to a total of two for our over 30 county buildings. Um, later on in this presentation, we'll talk about one of our objectives, which is a new team's approach for attacking building maintenance. Um, we've also funded the senior building equipment mechanic again to see that as a decrease to our backlog of work orders, respond to emergencies, do preventive maintenance on all the equipment that we have in our buildings, as well as fund the one and a half custodial positions. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, with that, to kind of highlight some of our objectives, we've picked four objectives today to highlight uh, to the board. Uh, one of the objectives is uh, by June 2020, general services will expand and improve parking uh, at the government center for employees and the public to increase the number of electric charging stations. Um, with this item here, we've been actually been working uh, behind the scenes, working on uh, including seven charging stations and an additional two for county owned vehicles, just like uh, Carol identified, installing four more this coming year at different work sites, uh, working with the Monterey Bay Community Powers and Air District to evaluate additional sites and future grant opportunities, uh, conducting a parking survey to evaluate and redesign and measure interest and trip, inter, uh, trip um, program. This item here we brought to the board on June 11th, um, brought back to the board for a partial expansion uh, into this and we are continuing to work on this as we move forward. For the second objective we wanted to highlight was a fleet redesign. With fleet redesign, uh, we, we have a few things that we've learned uh, about our fleet. Fleet services manages the purchasing and maintenance and repairs of all our county fleet, with the exception of DPW and heavy duty equipment. So far, uh, what we've learned is the majority of our county vehicles are underutilized. County has a guideline of about 7,000 miles per year of usage for our light vehicles. Almost more than 50% of our vehicles do not meet that minimum mileage. 
a lot of our vehicles do not have certain safety standards that you would expect to have in a fleet of vehicles, including anti-lock brake systems, child restraint anchoring standards that were established in 2005, passenger side airbags mandatory in all vehicles in 1998, and we do have vehicles that do not have driver side airbags which were mandatory in 1994. So in analyzing our fleet, we have some issues that have been identified as far as safety concerns uh, that we will be hoping to address as we go forward and working with the sales office and the user departments um, in helping it to look at different ways to utilize data in analyzing our fleet of vehicles. Um, for our facility security uh, component, uh, General Services has been, has been working on increasing a badge access system uh, for the 701 Government Center. Uh, the badge access system is about 95% complete installed. Uh, we have about two more pieces left and we anticipate by July 1, 2015, we should be able to flip the switch and have our auto lock system in place on our front doors to our 701 building. What that means is uh, after July 1, to get into the building, employees will need a badge uh, access in order to access the building. Uh, we'll be moving away from the current key system. That way we'll have better tracking and mechanisms of who enters our building. Uh, once we can show competency of the system within 701 Government Center, we do have intentions of uh, deploying the system out to other departments in other county buildings that may have an interest of using it. So the last objective we wanted to highlight happens to be one of the uh, uh, kind of a really exciting one in related to our, our facilities maintenance. Uh, the question that kept popping up is how do you do more with less? Uh, when you look at general services, we are uh, smaller. Uh, when you look at general services facilities maintenance team, we are smaller than we were uh, many years ago and we have more buildings than we did many years ago. And this is uh, something that's been highlighted by the uh, CO's office that deferred maintenance has been an issue uh, for this county for a while. In working with the crew uh, and, where's Bill? Yeah, sorry. Uh, in working with the crew uh, and their supervisor, Bill, uh, we've been working on developing a new system on how to develop our and handle our facilities maintenance. And I'll give you an example of some of the items that we're gonna do. We're gonna move into a team system. Right now, currently, every single one of our maintenance crew kind of works on an individual uh, assignment by their own. They go work on their own queues, uh, their own problems as uh, items come up, and it could be something as hanging something on the wall right here. The next item that person might have is down in Watsonville where they have to go paint something. And then the next item might be back over at the jail because something broke, right? We're working on trying to be, in changing the dynamic, instead of being reactionary, to being more systematic. So our two team system is basically one team that's gonna be handling emergencies, which will consist of a plumber, electrician. Um, so the guys know it better behind me than I do, so it's, uh, it's kind of exciting. Um, HVAC, uh, as well as the building maintenance worker crew, and a lead on each team. One team will handle general maintenance items. So as we get requests for hanging things on the wall or certain walls need to be painted, those will go into a queue until our general maintenance team gets to that building. They might get to that building once a month. Uh, we're trying to figure out all that out, but our game plan is that we're trying to get it once a month. That, that way we handle all those general maintenance items at one time. One thing that we're also trying to uh, eliminate is m multiple orders and runs to the supply store. We make quite a few runs a day over to Home Depot or to a different lumber store uh, just to get materials, just to come back to finish a job. In this new team model, we're working on whatever items that we need. We do one order, one guy goes over and picks it up the next morning and then we get back on the job. Um, with facilities maintenance, it's quite, kind of exciting um, and we look forward to uh, developing it as we move forward. With that, to kind of go a little bit more about Primo, I'm gonna pass it over to Carol. It's been a very exciting year for our staff with uh, process improvement. They, we've had two staff in our office go through the county cohort training and one has actually become a certified green belt. She will be able to assist with rolling out our other objectives, developing objectives for the upcoming years. We also have four liaisons, so their responsibilities are to keep rest of GSD staff informed as to what's going on related to our Primo projects. 
um, roll out resources, trainings that may be out there that are being offered by the um, CAO and provide other necessary updates just to keep us in the loop. What are other departments doing? What can we, what projects can we work with on, with other departments to enhance what they're already doing? So next I'd like to highlight, and this touches on some of what Michael went into, is looking at our primary Primo project, which was assessing our current work order management system. And to best give you an idea of what that is, is just kind of walk you through what we do when a work order comes in. And so primarily a department or someone in GSD will get a call for service. We'll enter that work order, rate it, whether it's high, low priority, it'll go into a queue, it'll get assigned to someone, and then um, they'll get dispatched to perform the work. They come back at the end of the day, they record, record their time and materials on a separate sheet. That sheet is then given to someone else to enter back into the system so that at the end of the day we can actually do some billing. What we're looking at and investigating along with parks and information services is a more mobile approach so that staff out in the field will actually have a tablet. They can see current work orders, they can see if a work order comes up that may be happening at a building that they're already at and can go into their queue. They can record their time starting and stopping on the tablet, record their materials. This saves them time at the end of the day when they don't have to come back to the office and, and do that work and enables us, if we had to, to be able to turn around that billing the following day because all the information would already be in the system. So we're not only looking at what's new and out there on the horizon, but also evaluating our own system to see whether it has those capabilities. We also wanna be able to upload as built into the system, service and maintenance manuals so that you know staff can troubleshoot equipment while they're in the field, not have to come back to the office and see those service manuals. And what you can see at the top picture on the right is actually our Primo team doing a swim lane looking at all the steps, and I think we probably came up with 20 or 30 that it took to actually do a work order. Very time consuming. So how can we go green, more paperless, um, be faster, quicker, more efficient at what we do and save the county time and energy? The other uh, Primo project that we had was ergonomic evaluations. In the past, our county safety officer performed all um, ergonomic evaluations. New employees, employees who moved locations, um, transfers, um, those who came in with a position's note. So what we've done is the safety officer has developed um, a simple outline that we are currently training individuals in, the, in each department to be able to perform those ergonomic evaluations that are routine. Um, or if somebody just moves from um, HSA to HSD or gets a new workstation. So they can go through a simple checklist, make sure that they're you know, looking at the computer at the right eye level, their feet are flat on the floor, their chair is adjusted the way it should be. But then the safety officer will continue to perform those non-routine um, evaluations. And what we've done is before we rolled out this program is we gathered information on what we're currently doing how many of them, which departments, how long it's taking us, and then we'll be able to do the same thing once this new program is rolled out. Working with personnel, get that information, which employees have moved departments, how fast are those new um, evaluations happening, and then of course, communicating to the departments, sending out a survey, getting feedback from them to determine what we did right, what we need improvement on, because of course it's pre -mail. So those are just a couple of the highlights um, that we've worked on in 18, 19 that'll continue a little bit into the new fiscal year. Uh, with that said, uh, this is kind of the conclusion of our general services budget. There was one other item that um, I forgot to mention under the getting stuff done, which is uh, the windows are clean at the Silwan Ocean Center, which was a huge accomplishment. Uh, I know that it's a uh, general service. We've been working on it for 10 years. Too long. Too long, so that was exciting. Uh, with that said, uh, we are asking the board to approve the 1921, 2019-21 proposed budget for general services as recommended by the county administrative officer uh, with the reference pages as identified on the screen. Okay, well thank you for your work. <clears throat> Those Primo projects sound exciting and uh, a great way to, to rethink the work you do and do it, do it more efficiently. Um, and thank you to all the people who do the, do the real work every day, 
coming out here and um, and for your work keeping this building uh, up and going and all all of our buildings. Are there any questions people have, Supervisor Leopold? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the ongoing work of everybody uh, in the room connected to general services. I know that when, uh, as I go through county buildings or see people in this building, uh, people are really geared toward helping other people out. And uh, general services is, is, is a good face of the county because people see uh, your staff um, throughout the county buildings every day. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the efforts that have been uh, going on to increase the number of EV chargers. Um, I know with the new parking lot expansion here that there are now state laws that require us to have um, uh, chargers as part of any parking lot expansion. Um, I don't know whether it's eight or 11 uh, chargers that will be required as part of those new 80 plus spaces. Um, do we have an idea of how we're gonna pay for those 11? The um, parking lot expansion project includes um, running conduit for an EV charging station back there. Um, we're also working with Monterey Bay Community Power and uh, the Air District to try and find grant opportunities to offset not only the cost, but the installation of those uh, uh, charging stations. To, answer, uh, to go specific with your question, we are exploring in our fleet redesign uh, how to go 100% electric with the vehicles. I know it's a pipe dream, but it also includes building an infrastructure uh, which would involve a whole need of a, a whole bay of electric charging stations. Uh, through some change orders, once with a, uh, we get the original bids back, we do plan on exploring how to add uh, and relocate some of our charging stations to make it more effective and efficient. Uh, we have about four charging stations that are used on the backside of our fleet uh, service center that are, I would consider, underutilized as they currently just charge one vehicle and one vehicle only, where if we can move them out uh, and put them in more of a systematic rotation where the public can use them as well. So those are things that we're working on and, and looking into, as well as we'll, we'll have to explore the legal requirement on the number of spaces we have to. Uh, that's something I'll have to look into. Yeah, my wife's a transportation planner, so she made me aware when I, when I talked <laughs> about the uh, the parking lot expansion that state law now requires. Uh, and I also think that PG&E has uh, some resources they like to put in 10 at a time. Um, they, they do. Which, is, which isn't necessarily a, um, something that we can always do, but if we're gonna be required to put in eight to 11 for, this, for, the, uh, for the new parking lot, um, that might be an opportunity to take advantage of some of those uh, funds as well. Um, uh, related to the charging piece, if there's a pl place to identify uh, uh, funding to put some kind of charger at th in any of the Soquel parking lots that we run, uh, it's, it's really a gap in, in the charging network that there is no chargers there. Uh, and it'd be great to be able to, to, uh, to have some kind of charging capability uh, in the village. Uh, most of the parking spaces are our parking spaces. So it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity. Um, related to the parking lot expansion, could, could you fill me in about what your understanding is of the park commission uh, recommendations about the, the using, use of the space next door? Uh, so uh, my understanding of the recommendations from the parks commission was that uh, use of the space, all revenue from the uh, uh, expanded parking goes to parks um, 100%. Uh, it it uh, basically resides as parks and under parks control. Uh, they rent it out as normal. Uh, just during the day, during operational hours um, of this building, we use it for county purposes. Uh, but besides that, it, it belongs to park just as it is today. Sure. Um, uh, uh, that was my understanding as well. And so one of the things I realized in the budget is that we've uh, accounted for over $90,000 of revenue from the parking permits to general services, and I'm not sure whether we need to take action to, to, to make that change to parks as part of our 
uh, process here? I, 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 I'm looking because I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So I've actually been meeting with, uh, we've been meeting with Jeff Gaffney, uh, Parks Director, and been talking about the different revenue agreements. Uh, there are some things, for example, the maintenance and repairs of the, the uh, parking lot out here is borne by the County General Services Department. Uh, so we are responsible for the repairs and maintenance as every time we have an asphalt repair, we repair it. Now, when the parking lot does get rented out by parks, it, it does include the whole parking lot, including the area that's uh, not just the parks portion here. Uh, so that revenue does go directly back to parks and it doesn't come to general services. So when parks does rent it out, they do collect 100% of that revenue for the whole campus. So I think there's two different revenue streams. One is the county employees, which, which uh, pay towards the parking, um, and that comes directly to general services, which is to us help maintain the parking lot in front of us, and then Parks maintains their revenue by uh, rentals of the property here and the parking spaces uh, during off hours. It, well, in the budget, there was an additional $144,000 from parking fees coming in this year, and at least in the response that I got over the weekend was that the um, uh, 1920 increase uh, is $111,600. And this is, says the increase is due to additional parking fees from the 701 parking lot expansion project. So I'm just, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where that goes and whether we need to take action around that. Yeah, sorry, so what that is is with the expanded parking, we do anticipate charging um, by increasing the uh, number of spaces available by 81 spots, yep. of which we anticipate uh, 76 of those spots being able to rent out uh, back to the county employees, which is part of the county employee program. Uh, we were originally keeping that with general services and our intention was that that revenue would stay with general services as is part of the county's employee parking program. Uh, we're going to be looking at that revenue when it does come in to augment other programs that the county does fund such as the bus program or the trip program, uh, some of the other alternative transportation programs. So uh, we've been using those uh, excess funds to uh, that we do get or if there is excess funds, those funds are dedicated right back to alternative transportation programs. So uh, I'm slightly confused as to whether the parking lot expansion is going to result in any new dollars to parks or not. If I can clarify, because I, I saw your question. Yeah. So our allowed 1819 budget for uh, parking fees was $85,000, and our 1920 amount for parking fees is actually 105000 so an increase of $20,000 in additional parking fees due to the parking lot expansion over here. Uh, okay, the so, uh, 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 so I appreciate the that, so I mean, understand the, the scope of the number. I'm just trying to figure out if it's a net increase to parks or a net decrease to general services. Uh, it should be a net decrease to both. Uh, the reason it's also a net increase to parks is those spaces during the off hours, they will be able to rent them additional. Um, I wish Jeff Gaffney was here, he'd be able to explain it a little bit better. Uh, but they'd be able to rent each one of those spaces, 81 spaces, to the uh, boardwalk, seaside company, and those venues, and collecting the additional revenue. So when we talk about, uh, so instead of them just renting out the lawn, uh, they make more money off of renting out parking spaces. So by renting out the parking spaces that we're expanding out here, that money does come additional back to parks. So it is complicated to explain and, <coughs> yeah. So the, the parking fees are gonna go to general services, the parking, uh, rentals will go to uh, parks. Correct. Okay. So unclear. So I appreciate the clarity. I appreciate the ongoing work and anything we could do to expand the charging network. I think will will uh, helps us achieve our our goals about reducing emissions. And I think we're we're slowly taking that on. And I appreciate the continued effort to to expand that out. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to just congratulate you for, I think uh, you're, you've included the employees too and just uh, getting a more efficient and, and a safe, this, uh, the safety factor that you mentioned is quite of a concern to me that it's gone on this long, but it's, uh, we're going to address it now, so congratulations on that. And it's, it's hard to believe, you know, that we have 30 buildings and uh, th this small crew right here takes care of them all. And I think probably, mo we could probably say the most important budget uh, addition we're gonna make as a plumber in uh, general services this year because, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, if we don't address our deferred maintenance uh, in a better fashion than we have, no, no blame to go on that, but 
uh, uh, we're going to pay the price, a uh, bigger price later. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I just uh, really appreciate the general services staff. Uh, they seem to always have a smile on their face, no matter how bad or dirty the job is. So thank you very much. <laughs> Here, here. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you for your report. I think we're going to, you know, approve it and everything. And I don't know on, on the vehicles. I, which one's better, uh, the Ford, Chevy, or Dodge, uh, uh, when it comes to the sheriff's department? Nobody knows. No them. comment. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could have them compete, uh, have a race out there at the fairgrounds. I'm sure something. you meant to inc include the Nissan Leaf that they have. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, kind of an interesting question uh, is, is, do we buy local or the vehicles, do we just go out for bid? Uh, so with the vehicles, we tend to use a purchasing co-op. Uh, so because we, uh, we get to join other governmental agencies in uh, our buying power, uh, so we do use a co-op uh, with the state of California, I think is the uh, co-op we use yes, last. Yes, correct. Uh, so we use the co-op with the state of California and uh, they actually purchase their vehicles out of Sacramento. Um, yeah. Or the dealership in California is out of Sacramento that that uh, the vehicles are processed through. Sure. So no. And you're also responsible for the uh, Santa Cruz County fire and their facilities. Uh, so the uh, operational budget of Santa Cruz County Fire does um, uh, reside under general services. Uh, we have the uh, a portion of it contracted out to County Fire with Chief Larkin, uh, but that does reside under general services. We do have the facilities. Each one of the firehouses is maintained uh, by the volunteers and or our agreement with County Fire currently. You bet. I want to thank all of you for all the work you're doing for the county and your very, very important uh, part of uh, how government actually responds and actually uh, helps people uh, with their taxpayer after they pay their taxpayer money. I, I you know, this is a little offbeat, but uh, you were telling me a, a very interesting, moving uh, uh, and personal story about a World War II veteran. And uh, I, if you want to share it, it would be great. Uh, it's, uh, it is the anniversary of uh, D-Day for World War II vets and also the Battle of the Bulge is coming up too. But if you want to share it, uh, it, it deals with your grandfather, right? Uh, it, it does. Um, uh, so recently uh, we had the passing of my uh, matriarch grandmother. Um, she was 95 years old, wore high heels all the way until she was 94. Um, when she passed away, we found, happened to find my grandfather's war chest and included letters, 388 letters from home uh, from the war. Um, and reading them are absolutely phenomenal and uh, we've been going through them uh, letter by letter in chronological order and uh, I, 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 we're only through about a year and a half uh, right now and it's just absolutely amazing to understand who my grandfather was, uh, a tank commander in World War II. He was at the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he earned a um, bronze star. He was an amazing man. I, I just wish I got to know him uh, more than uh, just the letters. So. You bet. And, uh, but how, there were quite a few letters, right? Yeah, 388 of them. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. I just actually wanted to briefly thank your crew here because <clears throat> we have, like, no department's actually been immune since the recession, every department has not been built back up, but this department's been disproportionately uh, not built back up while at the same time these buildings, um, while absolutely beautiful in 1965, according to at least the planning department, um, they have some things in their, in their office that shows that this building actually won an award, which I don't know who was the taste decider on that one. But, <laughs> But with that said, since that time, there really hasn't been any significant investment in it, and so you've got half the crew working on things that are aging even more, and, and we recognize that. And to Supervisor McPherson's comment, it doesn't matter which office I'm in, whether I'm here or I'm in Watsonville, I always seem to run into somebody from your team, which is a remarkable statement for how small it is, how present they are still. Uh, so. We recognize it. I mean, we don't have an easy solution for you. We've had good discussions with you, but we hear the need. And, and uh, the reality is it's, it's a discussion to even have with the community because there's really no constituency for facility upgrades in the same way that there are, is for a new park. Nobody wants a tax measure to remodel a county building or to, even though it's actually, it's just like with your own self, it's much cheaper to take care of yourself early on than it is to pay the medical bills on the back end. This is the same thing with buildings, uh, but it's hard to, 
have that conversation with the community about the investments we need to make in this building in order to not have those investments on the back end. But I just wanted you to know that we, we recognize it, and I think that everybody up here to it too appreciates the work that you do with limited resources and extended hours, and, and, um, and I appreciate your leadership on it, but I really do appreciate the line people and, the, and all the work you guys are putting in. Thank you. So uh, is there any members of the public that would like to speak to us? Come on up. Hey there. Uh, my name is Brian with the General Services Department, as you all here know. Um, <laughs> I wanted to respond with a thank you as well for you hearing, um, hearing us and taking action, actually. Uh, inspires a lot of confidence uh, in us that we see progress being made. Uh, our new director uh, has been just pulling off some amazing uh, feats. <laughs> and I appreciate you working with him to help him accomplish those goals. Um, that aside, uh, we have one uh, concern outside of uh, all the uh, amazing progress that we've got, and that's the uh, the two positions. I don't know if you have that slide um, showing our outlining our budget there. Um, we have two positions that don't appear on the 2021 budget, um, and that's been going on for several years now. These guys uh, started off on the six month term, and then got renewed for another six months, and then they got another year, and then another year. And that was all under a previous supervisor who's now left the county. Um, these gentlemen are incorporated into our teams and into all the services we provide, and we can't really go without them. Um, so we're hoping that maybe you know, you'll pay attention to that and do what's right by them and get them into a permanent position um, after all the time they've served. And that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Susan Cavalieri. I'm with the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. Um, back at the end of last year, the county declared a climate emergency. We are facing a climate emergency. Um, we're facing extinction of species. Biodiversity is, is at serious risk, and we as human beings are also. So I kind of hear a mixed message. I hear about parking lot expansion. To me, this encourages the use of single-use vehicles, um, and that is a business-as-usual approach. I do um, think that prioritizing the metro, biking, carpooling, uh, are the ways um, that the county should go. Um, I like the idea of the charging stations, but I do feel that most of the vehicles on the road are not electric vehicles. Um, and also with the p potential of a rollback of the fuel efficiency vehicles, we are at even greater risk when these um, fossil fuel vehicles are being used. Um, I think that the county should also prioritize electric vehicles um, because of the fossil fuels, and I believe the repair costs would be less. So overall, um, EVs are uh, a better idea. Um, I'm also happy about the fuel efficiency for the county buildings, the LED and solar. And um, so I think as far as transportation, it is really important to um, get people on board with alternatives to single occupancy vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Seeing no further speakers, a close public comment, bring it back to the board for action. Uh, second. Okay, I got a motion by McPherson, a second by Leopold. L let me just say that, that uh, uh, this item doesn't reflect all the different things that General Services is doing uh, to uh, get people out of their single occupancy vehicles. We have a, 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 we are losing parking spaces, which is why we needed to think about additional parking spaces, but we have a renewed effort in trying to get um, uh, people to use alternative transportation modes uh, that are also part of the action of, of moving forward with looking at this uh, uh, parking lot expansion. Uh, so uh, we, we care a lot about the climate uh, 
uh, uh, change challenge and we're gonna continue to work on it and uh, uh, General Services is one of our lead agencies to do that, so thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you and thank you to the team for the work. Uh, moving on to item number nine, this is to consider the 2019 to 21 proposed budgets for Information Services Department and schedule the final approval of items on the continuing agreement list uh, for the last day of budget hearings on June 25th, 2019 as outlined in the referenced budget documents and in the memorandum of the Information Services Director. Good morning, board. We're expecting you to tell us who your tailor is. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> I looked for uh, suit hoodies, but they didn't have any. I'm here this morning with my fiscal manager, retired Lieutenant Colonel Masahiro Kamai, who will be presenting the ISD's budget for you. Um, just to give you a, a quick picture of what we'll cover, we'll do a little bit of vision mission, um, what we cover, some of our accomplishments, um, summary, fiscal summary for the next couple of years. I'll do some strategic concerns, long-term concerns that we have, and then talk a little bit about our objectives. But before I start, I'd like to thank the, you all for giving me this opportunity, along with Carlos and Nicole, to run this department. It's been a privilege the entire time I've been here. I love this job. It's one of the most challenging jobs I've had. I'd also like to thank Dana, who's been here with me the entire time, going down the long road of software and hardware contracts. You're invaluable to me. I don't know what I'm gonna do without you. Um, Tibby McCann, Tammy Weigel, and Masahiro, for all their help running this department, this is a hard department to run. And my staff, I couldn't do this job without my staff. I have really dedicated, hardworking staff who work ungodly hours, who knows when around here, to keep this place up and running. And lastly, to all the user departments for their support and assistance, because without them, I wouldn't be here. So to give you a picture, we did a quick vision mission this year with the strategic plan. So we believe government must be resilient and responsive to the evolving needs of its citizens. We partner with all departments to apply the best technology to serve our collective users. We are a service department to the county. We serve the county's residents through our user departments. And to give you a picture of what the department's responsible for, you all look at us, most people look at us and they think they're PCs on their desk. That's a small piece of what the department does. We support the entire telecommunications backbone for all the buildings. There's about 45 buildings that are attached into us. We support mail and duplicating services. We do programming and project management. We do general infrastructure, which is our server, our network, um, and everything that's there to make it run. We also support the extensions into the cloud for some of the cloud systems. We have an integrated help desk. We do GIS and we support the public safety and general government radio services. Just a couple of things that we did this year. So we put up a communications tower in Davenport. That's the first communications tower um, that anybody could think about for the last 20, at least 20 some years here. Um, and that's, that is up and running. It's providing um, a lot more North Coast coverage for our Sheriff Department. We did, impl we implemented an electronic benefits enrollment so that your, when you had to do your signups for insurance this year, that was all, as an option, you could do them electronically. That one wasn't advertised a lot but we got a 35% penetration of county employees, so I take that as a huge success. Um, we also, and it put a lot of enabling technologies up this year, so these are foundation technologies that we expect the county to build off of. DocuSign is our e-signature platform. That's the one as we go more and more paperless. We expect to see more migration into that platform. That was what was done with the electronic benefits. Uh, enrollment. 
Laser, Laserfish is our electronic document management system that replaces an ancient one that we had, um, which was Fortis. That's currently only used by the Assessor, Auditor, Environmental Health, and Public Works. And we expect to see that expand over time because you can tie that in with e-signature. The other part that we're really investing a lot of effort in is our Power BI platform. So Power BI is a business intelligence package. So it lets you do a lot of data analysis and slice and dice. And we're, we're looking to use it for the performance metrics part of, of what the county's gonna be doing in the forward, in the, in the upcoming years. And that's available for the entire county, can view these things. And then there's um, some licenses for, for creating them. On our payroll personnel system, the never-ending payroll personnel system, we did 225 enhancements this year. We also added a web version of Citizen Connect. So we had requests over the years of not just wanting the mobile platform, but wanting a website. So that went live this year. I'm gonna turn it over to Masahiro now to go through some of our financial summary. Good morning. I'll orient you to the graphic here. Have expenditures to the left, revenues to the right. Uh, what it presents is a five-year history running from fiscal 14 through 18 of uh, what actually transpired, as well as the year of execution or the current year, rather, and the two budget years. Uh, for those years with actuals, that would be uh, the history in the current year. I present in the darker color what was budgeted and in the lighter color what the actuals were and the budgeted years were reflected in gray. And the same methodology is reflected in, in the revenues to the, uh, to the right. And so what you can see is that 14-15, uh, we're about a 5% uh, per year increase in, uh, in budgeted expenditures. And uh, it jumped to about 8%, 16-17 through the current year. And what you see is a 6% reduction next year driven by special circumstances that I'll get into later, uh, followed by another 8% increase in 21 uh, to follow the, uh, the original trend. What you can also see is that uh, we've consistently uh, with the exception of the current year, uh, under obligated against the, our, uh, our budgeted expenditures. So we've always come in below. And, we, and if you compare that to the actual revenues, we've always come in ahead in terms of, uh, in, in terms of coming in in the black at the end of the year. Uh, so uh, those are the highlights that I wanted to, to bring up there. For fiscal 20, we're looking at, uh, at uh, 17,232. Um, 17 million 232,000 for the uh, for our, our uh, expenditures, uh, out of which about 62% is in salary and benefits. On the revenue side, you can see that uh, just about everything's in charges for services. We have a about a 220k increase across the department in salaries and benefits, which is less than you would expect for a department of our size. And that's driven by the fact that we're unfunding an administrative position. Uh, you see a one-time reduction in our other charges, almost uh, uh, half a million, and that's because the uh, county overhead is, uh, that was taken from us in a prior year uh, and over, as an overcharge is uh, being restored to us for the, uh, the, the next fiscal year, and that's why our, our, uh, our budget is dropping in the, in the next year. You'll see it uh, rise right back up in the following year. Uh, the other special event is the reduction in, uh, in the other financing upon the uh, successful conclusion of the Davenport Tower project, and that came in uh, about 400K under budget. So the next year, um, 17 and a half million is the, is the requested amount, and uh, of which a little over 60% is gonna be in salary benefits alone. About 400K increase in salaries and benefits across the department, about the, what you'd expect for a department of our size. Services and supplies uh, show an increase partly driven by the restoration or the, uh, the bias uh, being charged the regular amount for our, our county overhead. And uh, the services and supplies get captured in our intertransfer, uh, intrafund transfers uh, across the department. Some areas of concerns I have moving forward. So some of you know AT&T has stopped investing in their copper, their copper backbone. That's the, you know, our, our general POTS lines, the Plano Telephone Service, T1 circuits, things like that. Um, they have a hard time finding people that know how to work on that, that old stuff. 
um, and they're just moving everything to fiber optic. So we've been investing to try to move off of the copper backbone into the fiber optic transport. Our data center today, I'm sure you all know, sits in a floodplain um, with climate change and every year of storms, I lose a little bit more hair during the winter, um, trying to figure out if this thing's going to survive. So we're, we're trying to hook into the long range facility plan as to eventually see if we can get a way of getting this thing out of there. And it's more than the data center. You'll see all of the state, all of the communications from the state and other, uh, and other things come into this building and then they distribute out from here. We're working, we continue to work on our um, contingency operations. So we have a small second data center over at Chanticleer and we have a number of our critical systems are replicated over there and will come up live if this building goes down. So we're trying to prepare for things like an earthquake where there may be an event here. So if the EOC is up and running, some of those critical systems are still available at the EOC. We're going to lose dark fiber. So if you don't know, when the original um, Comcast, well, it's in Comcast TCI cable franchise came in here, we were given extra little fiber circuits in the bundles um, that aren't part of Comcast, they were ours. And it was given to us through that franchise. When we lost our local franchise and it went to the state franchise, uh, dark fiber went away. Um, it's not something the state picked up in the franchise agreements. We had an outstanding lawsuit with Comcast. We were able to keep the dark fiber longer. We have it through June 2021. It connects, right now it connects us to the Ameline campus and distribution of the buildings at Ameline are done through dark fiber and it also connects us to the jail. We're in negotiations to try to figure out what we're going to do when that goes away. Cost will go up. Um, we have a proposal from Comcast who at the end of June 2021 have decided we should pay for it. So. Um, it's not cheap from them. We're just trying to figure out what all of our alternatives are at this point. We continue to work on cyber crime and cyber, cyber terrorism. I'll cover that a little bit in another slide. We're also looking at redoing our, our, our radio um, infrastructure, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and that's uh, really our microwave backbone that we have up and running. So let's go through some of our operational plan objectives. Some of these I'll zip through quick. So we are, you've all gotten a survey from us um, on our, our service delivery. So we're showing by June 2020, we're going to increase uh, customer department satisfaction by 10% based on survey results. And we're doing a couple of things there. You have the, the survey we've just put out, which we're analyzing and still getting feedback on. My staff live through a ticketing system, so the other thing that will happen is when someone puts in a ticket, at the close of the ticket, this is the most important one for us, they'll get a one question survey. Did we satisfy your needs? If yes, things are great, you won't hear from us. If no, someone's gonna pick up the phone and ask you, what could we have done better? And that's what we'll be using to model moving forward. So on security, we're, we're in the middle of doing a, a lot of things on the security front. So there's, there are things that we do that you all don't know and, and I don't wanna cover in a lot of detail in public to protect the county network. Um, we, we did have uh, an audit from the Department of Homeland uh, Security around our election system. They did penetration tests into the county, um, trying to see if they could find weaknesses. We passed all of those tests. They were impressed with, given our size, what we were able to do. We uh, are now going to be working with DHS on a couple other tests, which I prefer to not talk about. We work with a multi-state agency or a multi-state group that does uh, information sharing around security and we're always taking their input. And we work with the, uh, the UASI group over the hill. Now what we're focusing on is what I consider the weakest link, which is the 2,500 employees. I have 2,500 employees who can just click a button and cause problems. And what we tend to think of that is we're one click away from disaster here. So that's why we've done the training program. Now, unfortunately, 
We did baseline tests prior to the training program. We trained everyone. We did tests again, and it didn't nudge. We have the same percentage failures, which are too high. <coughs> we're, we're running over 10% um, click-through of people clicking the links they really shouldn't be clicking. So we're going to continue training. We're going to continue looking at the training program to see if there's other ways that we can do to, to, to tighten it up. You should know there's been 22 known ransomware attacks against state and local government this year alone. In the last two years, we've seen major entities hit like Baltimore, um, Atlanta, Albany, New York. We've had smaller counties like Imperial County just got hit a couple of, uh, last month. Uh, San Benito got, County got hit. All of those are concerns and they're what keep me up at night. So another one, our, our radio shop. We're, we're continue to work at improving the reliability of the radio system. We're in the middle of replacing um, a big chunk of the infrastructure now, which was kind of unsupported. The new infrastructure works really good. We've got um, some things running on it right now. We've got public works running on it. We just moved uh, Fire Yellow on it. And we're going to be looking at the sheriff and the other uh, fire um, and local, well, local governments on it right now. That's one thing. The other thing that we're looking at is our microwave backbone is part of that network. Um, it's end of life. Um, we're going to be looking at making it smaller and just connecting the critical sites. When I talked about the, the antiquated copper, a lot of our radio sites are up running on copper just because they're located out in the middle of nowhere and that's the only option I have. So those are always a concern with reliability. First rain comes in, we know we're going to lose some number of radio sites because that's what happens with AT&T. GIS is uh, doing an update of our aerial imagery. We're going to move that to a four-year refresh cycle. Uh, it's been kind of hit and miss as to when we've done it in the past. Public Works really would like to see it on a four, or they would like to see it on a two-year cycle. We're going to commit to a four-year cycle. This is a lot of negotiations that Matt Price has to do with the cities and some of the other outside districts to get them to offset the cost of, of updating our aerial imagery. This is one of our primo projects. So we're looking at improving our, our use of our, our, how we do uh, performance metrics. And it also it has to do with how we resolve our problems. It has to do with how we use our ticketing system. This is a primo project and we're trying to, to look at just how we do it, how things pass between our different parts of my organization and make sure that we can and close things out and get things done correctly. Those are our objectives, but if you looked in the book, you're going to see that we're listed as collaborators on 38 other objectives, and those are the departments that we found out there. We also found an additional six ob objectives that don't list us, but we'll probably need our support to get done. So it's going to be a busy few years for us. But now just a couple of minutes on some of the things that I'm really interested in doing that we're early stages for, but I, I think are, are interesting. So we've been partnered with GSD on a couple of areas. You all have seen, I'm sure, the public when they come in that don't know where to go in the building, they're somewhat confused, you can't read the wall very good. So we're, we're currently looking at adding an Alexa skill so that someone can actually at home or in the building just walk up to something and say, how do, where do I go to get this? How do I get this? Who do I see to do that? And then they'll get you know, voice directions on what they should be doing then. We think this is going to be interesting. It can replace a chunk of our, um, the, the question part of the website and we'll look at expanding it. We want to tie that to another interesting thing in Citizen Connect, which is in-building and in-campus navigation. So the other one you've seen is people that are confused in our building. They can't tell where county clerk is or where do I go to get this done? Where do I go to get my wedding certificate? Um, and when they wander the floors sometimes. So we're looking at, at deploying um, the technology so that you can actually, from your phone, be able to see a map and then get um, highlighted marks of where you need to walk to to get to find what you need. And if you're at M-Line, be able to wander through the M-Line campus and figure out where you are. 
We're heavily invested, uh, uh, no, before I do that one, we are adding web conferencing into this infrastructure here in July. So that will enable us in the future to be able to run split board sessions so that we could actually have a South County presence and a North County running here through the same system, running through Comcast and Charter at the same time. We're fully invested in the Primo stuff. So we have three, three of the Primo projects. We have four people that are um, green belt qualified. We have three certified green belts and I have one master black belt in the department. A teaser for you, you'll hear more from planning, but we've been working with planning on an online application for over-the-counter permits. So it's a full one-stop shop from being able to start the application through to paying and getting the permit without coming into the building. And I think planning will talk about that more during their session. And that brings me back to why we're here. We'd like to have you approve our budget. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Questions? To Mr. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks for the ongoing work. Whenever I've called uh, ISD, you guys have always been there. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, the question about the dark fiber um, uh, and the loss of that with Comcast, uh, my colleague would probably know the answer to this, but the fiber, I thought Sinesis put that dark fiber right down Soquel Drive. And can we use that? Is that, is, you know, what's, Sinesis doesn't get close to the Emmeline campus. Sinesis runs fairly close to us here, but it doesn't go that path. It actually travels this side of Highway 1 um, down a significant part before it crosses over. Um, oh, and I should tell you, we did quote, we did ask Sinesis for quotes on bringing, um, replacing some of that, yeah. and that was the highest of anybody. Sobering. Um, what about wireless? Is that is that anywhere near the speed uh, necessary? We we always look at wireless and point essentially the point to point um, thing. So like with our May Avenue building, we're point to point wireless to from here to there. We'll be looking at it with the gel. Um, Emma Line's a little bit of a challenge because of the trees and the fact that it's it's sunk down a little bit lower there. Um, we are looking at maybe um, using it between the buildings at at Emmeline, but we're also looking at just pulling our own. Since we own the we own the underground vaults over there, we have pulled our own between one of the buildings already, so we can pull additional fiber on our own there. Yeah, well, it seems uh, at the at the sheriff center, uh, with Kaiser coming right down the uh, the street or the proposal, and if we approve that, they're going to have an interest in that same thing. And I'm wondering if we could uh, partner with them. Um, about uh, the installation of dark fiber along that Soquel Avenue corridor um, and maybe making it less expensive to be able to do something uh, over at the Emma line uh, piece. It would be worthwhile. Uh, the other thing I just want to uh, commend you on thinking about, um, worrying about, is the, the question of data security. Uh, you and I have talked about this a, a bunch. Uh, I know we all think about it when we read those New York Times stories about cities that are being held for ransom, um, and just the, the vulnerability that we all face. Um, when I saw the numbers that came in after, after the, the, um, uh, the training, it was sobering um, and uh, worrisome. And I, I'm not exactly sure how you take human fallibility out of the equation, because these guys are, the people who are doing this are very sophisticated. Um, and it isn't just, you know, a Nigerian prince who is offering me money these days. It's, it's lots of things that, are, that will be, might be more attractive uh, for people to click on. And I think we, you just have to constantly be thinking about it. And, um, and we're going to have to try whatever we can to, to ensure that all those 2,400 or 2,500 points of vulnerability uh, don't get realized. But, yeah. uh, it's scary. Right. Thank you for your work. Any other questions? <coughs> so we want, I had to take away one of your nightmares and change the basement to somewhere else. How big of a facility would that take um, to try to? I'm looking at Tammy if she's here. 
It's smaller than what we have today. The stuff really? shrinks every year. Oh, good. That's good news. So we don't need something the size of the data center down here. The big issue is that it's the, the weight of the equipment. So when you go out to look for a facility, you have to look at something that has a subfloor that can maintain several tons of equipment. Um, it's not just the servers and things like that. It's also the power distribution units. It's the HVAC and things like that. So when we look at a building, we like to go into a new building because it's a lot easier than trying to retrofit a existing building. And obviously be above the, above the uh, floodplain and out of like an earthquake shake zone. Um, we always joke in the data center, it's, you probably pick the worst place to put a data center <laughs> in this building because it's in a tsunami zone, a flood zone, and an earthquake zone. So. But yeah, we don't need a big space, it just needs to be a space that can maintain that equipment, along with the power. Pleasure, Brent. I, I just wanted to make a, a comment about the future, which is the reality is that people are expecting to interact with government more through technology. They're expecting to um, have things happen in a much more accommodating way where they're not required to uh, show up during certain work hours in order to have things done, and that'll all fall exclusively on the back of your department as, long, as well as every other department recognizing that this is the way that the world is going. I recognize it's not the way it's always been, but it's the way that the world is going. And so I appreciate that, that we have um, at times slowly and at times actually made actually pretty significant leaps toward this end. I think that the online permitting component that will come forward in planning is, is well overdue, and I appreciate their willingness and your willingness to do that. I've been actually uh, really impressed by the number of people in my district that speak to the power of Citizen Connect or its new branding uh, name, uh, how much they like to have the interactivity because they feel like when they just submit a request, they don't know what happens to it. In this situation, though, they can track it and they get feedback. It's also less expensive as a service providing for the government to do this. It's faster. And as we received at the beginning of the day uh, this reality that we're going to end up with additional cuts most likely leading in the future, one of the ways that can help ensure that our highest level of service is still provided is through your department, so I appreciate that. Um, I had received in, in our communications about some of the cybersecurity that Supervisor Leopold was talking about, that we, we do have, a, I mean, th literally thousands of attempts to penetrate the firewall every single day here. Yeah. And I don't think people think about things like uh, Baltimore and they think about things like Albany and Atlanta, but right here in our own county, we have about 5,000 attempts to breach our firewall every single day. And just to put that in perspective, every single moment somebody's trying to get in to this system. So without you at that front line, we would bring down every other component of the system here. So I appreciate the work of your staff doing that. And I appreciate you thinking about how we'll move to the future for those services provided. Mr. Bowling, thank you. Thank you. Actually, I want to follow up on Supervisor Friend's question, which is, um, you correctly stated that you are a service provider to the agencies or departments that are then service providers. But how do you identify um, points at which the public is seeking to interact with the county that may have a good technological solution that, that you would know about, the departments may not know about it, whereas and, but the departments know how people are interacting with them, but you may not know what the departments are doing. So what's that? And so that's interesting, and I didn't, I didn't talk about that at all, but we've instituted a new program inside the department just in the last few months where what I've done is assigned essentially a liaison person to each department. Um, their primary job is to learn what that department does and then be the conduit back and forth so that they would be my evangelist trying to propose to them, here's technology solutions for what I see as your business issues while they're learning the, their business. Okay, oh, that's a great, I'm glad you're doing that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, are there any members of the public who like to speak to us about this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I move the recommended actions for the uh, Information Services Department. Sorry. Motion by Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number 10, this is considered the 2019-2021 proposed budgets for personnel and risk management as outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule the uh, continuing agreements list items for the last day on the last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as outlined in the memorandum of the personnel director. We have Ms. Patel here to speak to us.
Good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. Alongside with me today is Enrique Sagoon, our risk manager, and joining us in the audience are members of our senior staff team. Oh, clicker problem. It is my pleasure to be here today to present our department mission statement, county workforce data, department overview, 1819 highlights and accomplishments, the proposed budget request, and our future objectives. In collaboration with our customers, the personnel department will recruit, develop, support, and retain an ethical, professional, and diverse workforce dedicated to serving the community. My staff and I are consistently impressed by the talented people who join our county team. I would like to thank each and every county employee, from line staff to elected officials, for all your tireless efforts as public servants. And of course, a special shout out to my staff who support me day in and day out. Our demographic, dur excuse me, during the Great Recession, our workforce was down to approximately 1,700 employees. We have built the workforce back to approximately 2,200 employees. Our demographics are ever-changing and we see more employees entering government at different phases in their career, which is a slight change from previous years. Our workforce is comprised of employees with varied backgrounds and based on the 2010 census, staff representation is reflective of our community. The personnel department has four divisions that provide services to internal and external customers. The Employee Relations Salary Administration is responsible for labor relations, training, negotiations, contract implementation, classification, and salary functions. The Employment Services Division handles the county's recruitment, testing, and selection functions. The Equal Employment Opportunity Office administers and monitors federal and state compliance programs and staffs five commissions. The Risk Management Division is responsible for risk mitigation, liability and property, workers' compensation, unemployment and benefits. Each division has completed a number of tasks this year. URSA has parten partnered with the CAO's office to host our first ever CSAC Institute here in Santa Cruz County. Counties must apply to host, and it is an extreme honor to market our agency throughout California in this manner. The Risk Division launched a new feature during open enrollment that allows employees to make changes to their benefits online. 446 employees utilized the fillable forms, which eliminated paper usage, travel time, provided convenience and efficiencies for our employees and their families. This project also enhanced collaboration and teamwork between ISD and our staff. The EO division improved our course selection for Santa Cruz County Learns by modifying diversity course selections to address employee needs within our organization. Staff recognizes that our environment is constantly changing and it is important to provide resources that align accordingly. The Employment Services Division embarked on a few initiatives this past year. First, staff rolled out a new marketing strategy that emphasizes the beauty of our coastal community and modernized our recruiting materials to add visual appeal. On the left, you will see our old job announcement. On the right is our new. Additionally, staff focused on branding the County of Santa Cruz. Our branding tactic is displayed in our materials and we invite each of you to help market our live here, work here, and play here motto. On May 22nd, the personnel department held our first annual county career fair here at the government center. Our goal was to reach job seekers and take the opportunity to educate the community about countywide services. There were over 400 attendees we had 100% department participation and our neighbors from the courts also joined in. The energy and spirit to collaborate amongst departments was heartfelt. We also included workshops 
focusing on resume critique, how to get a job with the county, and interviewing skills. It was definitely a festive environment to be had for all. Attendees were able to enjoy food from food trucks, and our chief probation officer played snazzy music throughout the event, so we thank him and his friends. <laughs> Lastly, the Employment Services Division continues to focus on their PRIMO project. Our goal is to reduce the time it takes to establish eligibility lists to better serve our customers. Staff are utilizing the Lean Six Sigma principles. They're currently in the defined phase, which requires them to examine, analyze, and assess the voice of the customer. Through this process, we have determined that there are 100 steps to establish a list. At the end of June, staff will move into the measure phase, whereby they will use data to establish baseline measures and set targets to reduce the time it takes to establish eligibility lists. Targets will be set by December 31st of this year, if not sooner. By June 2020, we will report back on progress towards our target goals. Our work on the recruitment process will not end here. The recruitment process involves outlying departments as they are involved in pieces of the recruitment in the beginning and certainly at the end when they are provided a list from which they, make, which they interview and make selections. Our staff, which now includes three Green Belt certified employees, will work with departments to look at their systems and processes also. The concept of continuous process improvement is certainly not a one-time effort, and we will continue to build a culture that includes improvements ongoing. Our budget premise is to maintain stability, manage our increasing workload, and use internal talent and resources to keep the programs intact. We are proposing status quo staffing at 38 positions, a budget request of approximately 3.5 million for personnel administration, and 46 million for the risk management division. Our budget challenge with the personnel administration budget was to manage increases associated with salaries and benefits. Although over the prior five years we met our county goal of zero net county cost increase, there is a slight increase in the general fund contribution of approximately $15,000 or 1.8% for the next fiscal year. The risk management budget is divided into six units that support essential countywide programs. Funding principles include operational costs, experience, exposure, and reserve goals. Staff work closely with the CAO's office to establish departmental charges to fund these programs. We will be reviewing our funding principles this year to ensure that we are conforming to industry best practices. One area that staff is focusing on following in your board's footsteps is to ensure that reserve levels are increasing. I would like to briefly highlight a few of the funds. The Liability and Property Program <coughs> protects the county from losses or damages to others and county property. Claims history goes up and down and staff works closely with departments throughout the year to mitigate the risk. We will begin the next fiscal year with approximately $5 million in the Liability and Property Reserves, which is a move in the right direction based on actuarial goals. The Workers' Compensation Fund is utilized to manage costs associated with industrial injuries. The number of ongoing claims is decreasing, and we attribute this to preventative measures, training, and case closure of some long-time claims. This reserve is 42% funded, and staff intends to focus on improving the fund balance. Some approaches to building the reserve will include closure of cases within a shorter time frame and exploring strategies to decrease operating costs. The UI funds support costs associated with employee turnover. We have met our goal for these reserves, which are based on experience and exposure. As we move into the next fiscal year, I would like to highlight a few of the initiatives that are included in the operational plan. We share workspaces. We are looking forward to working with general services and information services to create workspaces in South County that can support an improved work-life balance for commuters. Employees who otherwise drive in each day can reserve a workstation in South County, which in some cases may enhance service delivery, 
efficiencies, and productivity. The program is dependent on available space and will be tested as a pilot. We will determine capacity and survey departments who may have a need for this type of, type of program and select pilot participants accordingly. An important goal in our strategic plan is to focus on our county workforce. By June 2020, the personnel department will develop and establish an employee engagement platform. An employee survey is essential to this process in understanding and exploring the needs of our existing workforce. The information obtained will help develop resources to address employee retention, growth, and engagement. We look forward to utilizing technology to improve employee access and convenience. To that end, we will promote online benefits transactions. An example of this is adding an online adjustment feature to manage deferred compensation contributions and smartphone access to workers' compensation claim information. We look forward to your ongoing feedback as to the work that we're doing on the initiatives I've highlighted and others in our operational plan. As you can see, we have a busy year ahead of us, which also includes negotiations with a number of the bargaining units. And as always, we look forward to working with our labor partners and finding a balance that supports harmonious labor relations. In conjunction with the CAO's office, we recommend that you approve the proposed budget as outlined in the budget documents. And with that, I will conclude my comments and staff and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have and please note Enrique wore a suit and a tie also <laughs> because we're asking you for money too. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're increasing our tax base with suit sales. Uh, so uh, any questions or comments? So Enrique wears a suit every day. So, not, so he can't get away with just this one situation of asking for money, so I know that. But I do want to actually compliment you on a few things here. Obviously, the, the branding campaign is, is great. Uh, I've just seen the visuals around here and seen it around the community. I think it does make it uh, an attractive application for us. But in addition, the, the telecommute function, for lack of better terms, to be able to have a shared workplace. Um, now, while I didn't write a book on it, like my colleague, I will say that it really is something that we need to move toward, that work isn't a place you go, but something you do, in, in the sense that for those of us that live in the South County area, I mean, any sort of small percentage of removing people off of that, that uh, commute would have other tangential benefits. I mean, we're the second largest employer. We've got the university in us. A disproportionate amount of the workforce lives in the mid to South County. Uh, if we're gonna have all these other initiatives that we talk about from, uh, making sure everything's solar and we got climate change action plans and yet we do nothing for the workforce that's actually doing this commute and contributing to this, then we obviously aren't fully practicing what we preach. So I would like to see this move beyond a pilot program moving forward. I think it's an important thing for us to realize that it's the way things are gonna have to be is where the more affordable housing is and how do we respect our employees? Well, not making them have to choose between whether they can make it to their kid's baseball game or not because of the way that the commutes are. There's something we can do better uh, in that regard. And I think this would be a small but a very important step toward it. So I appreciate that you're, you're taking that. The suit does look good. Right. That it does. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for the ongoing work. Uh, you, uh, the times in which uh, the board has had to interact with personnel on uh, uh, hiring a new CAO or looking at other uh, pieces, uh, you've been very useful and, and I appreciate the help that you and, and County Council have given for other uh, recruitments uh, for other local agencies like the Regional Transportation Commission, the Metro, et cetera. Um, the uh, the uh, objectives and key steps that are in the operational plans are all excellent. Um, uh, I particularly just want to uh, highlight things that you didn't talk about, uh, but I think are also uh, very good. Uh, one, about the gender neutrality in our, uh, in all of our, um, documents and recruitments, I think that that is useful and follows along with what the uh, the board is trying to do around our code. So I, I appreciate uh, awareness and taking active steps to make that happen. And then you, you have uh, uh, your key part in, in helping maintain morale uh, here uh, in the county family 
and uh, th some of these objectives will look very interesting to help do that. And uh, I'm wondering if you could ta talk a little bit about what you see as part of the Community Reads website and, and what goals you, you see there, uh, the success of that effort. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So the Community Reads website is actually an uh, effort that we have created in collaboration with the CAO's office, and we should be launching that fairly soon, actually. And the idea is that we want to put a website out there where interested employees can d look at what we're all reading together and read something together for our professional development and of course it's voluntary they can choose to partake or not but the idea would be that we will also have throughout the county we'll select a book and then we will have some community discussions which will be held at lunchtime or they could be held at um, evening time and leaders here in the community will be able to say on a link I'll be holding a book read at this place. Please join if you'd like to discuss. And we'll do them at different locations in the campuses. We'd like to do one at South County, Emmeline, so different leaders can pick where they'd like to go, but we don't want it just here at this building. The idea is to be able to get out there and discuss with employees our professional reading, ideas, thoughts, and how, how we can do things differently and just all kinds of different ideas depending on what book we're reading. And the idea is to also connect employees cross county. Many of us, we work in this building, we see each other. We don't always get the opportunity to go out to different locations and connect with other employees. And so while we're looking to do that as leaders, we would like to see our line staff and all connect across the way too. And so we're the website is actually almost ready and we should be launching, I would say, actually a little earlier than we put in the objective plan um, this month. And what kind of books would, would... So they would be books on um, how to lead, how to communicate, how to interact. And what we will be doing is selecting books with the CAO's office. And we've actually got a couple in the pipe that we're looking at. And so I don't want to give too much away about which one we're picking. So I want you to stay surprised. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Appreciate the work. You. Just a couple uh, <clears throat> for comments. First of all, yeah, the the branding and the interaction, uh, partnering with UCSC to bring some st potential students and potential employees down uh, here was great. Um, it'd be great if we could, the demographic, the slide that you had on the, the age demographic of our workforce, be great if we could see that over the last 10 years just to see how, what changes have happened. Absolutely. Um, second is the uh, workers' comp. Uh, being funded at 42 percent, um, it'd also be nice to know how much that number is coming down. Because there's there's one way is to increase reserves, the other way is to to have the workers' comp uh, number come down, right? And then um, so so the trends that we're seeing in that uh, would be helpful. Uh, um, and then the last part was, and a supervisor friend mentioned, it's incredibly important that we provide people flexibility on where they work. It's also important that we provide flexibility on when they work. And for the hard to recruit positions, the flexibility around time or part time, um, what we can do to be able to attract uh, the people we need in the county, understanding that people, for a variety of reasons, may not want to work here full time, but but may want to do job shares or other opportunities. I think that's that's going to be the future: is figuring out um, how people can plug in and in, in targeted ways into our workforce. Um, uh, if, any other questions or comments? I'd entertain them. Oh, sorry, I'll ask if there's any public comment. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I move the recommended actions for this department. So we got a motion by Leopold and a second by Caput. All, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number 11, which is to consider the 2019 proposed budgets for the CAO's office, including the clerk of the board as outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule the uh, s continuing agreements list for the final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the CAO. Strange, the CAO is wearing a suit again today. Uh -huh. <laughs> Must want money. <laughs> Let's see. Are we Good morning, everyone. 
Members of the board, Mr. Chair, I'm Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO. We have a tag team uh, presentation for you today on the CAO's department budget. I will be kicking it off and ending it, but then we will be um, sort of passing the mic um, across the four of us today. As you can see, oh, I don't have the clicker. Who is the clicker? Oh, that's right. You'll okay, have I'll to keep it this way. Consistent with the rest of our uh, presentations this week, uh, we'll be providing a quick departmental overview, some review of our highlights over the 18-19 year. We'll then move into our proposed budget, spend some time on our uh, county initiatives and key uh, objectives for 19-20 uh, and into through 21, and then we'll close with a recommendation for the budget. As you are well aware, uh, the, our, our department consists of both our county administrative office and the clerk of the board. These uh, slide here presents our overall um, legal responsibility and functions, but we also, as you know, manage the considerable number of initiatives around performance management from strategic planning, operational planning, performance measurement, continuous process improvement, the Cannabis Office, Economic Development, and Homeless Services. We are a very full office with a lot on our, a lot on our plates. I'm going to move into our highlights for the last year. I was really excited to see already some of our departments talking about their involvement in Primo in its first year. As you know, we launched in the fall. Uh, we had five employee engagement uh, sessions in December and January, and that was actually at the direction of this board in terms of doing increased engagement with our workforce. Very, they were, this photo here is a photo from one of the sessions at Emmeline. Um, they've been very well attended, and some of the feedback we've gotten on the first year is to keep doing them. And both of that's been do it within departments to promote um, attention and sort of synergy within departments around Primo and the principles and tools, but also to, to continue doing that cross-departmental engagement because people like to meet other people from departments and talk about potential improvements. Um, we, a key part of our Primo program has been uh, demonstration projects. When we reported to you in the end of February, we had cited 11 uh, central projects. We now have a second cohort of Greenbelt training actually being sponsored through the Whole Person Care Initiative, and we have seven additional projects that are going on. So we're up to 18 Primo pro projects that are underway. We continue to work on our, our real goal of building internal operational capacity, and that's through training of our managers, our lean practitioners are really the folks who are leading the projects, and then departmental li liaisons to continue working on general awareness and engagement. <coughs> With that, I'm gonna pass it to Nicole. So Nicole Coburn, Assistant County Administrative Officer. Um, so good morning. So this, as you know, this board adopted our first strategic plan last June when we were here um, wrapping up budget hearings. And so one of the big tasks this year was to promote the plan both with departments and throughout the community. So we deployed posters and outdoor banners at all of the county campuses, which are visible here at 701 as well. Um, we distributed over 2,500 brochures, and we have made our trifolds available both in English and Spanish, and we'll continue to make all of our materials available as we continue through the six years of the strategic plan. Um, this year, we've also developed our first two-year budget, and um, a accompanying that is our first two-year operational plan. So the two-year budget, as you know, provides greater transparency and shows what where the county's headed over the next two years. Um, along with it is our blueprint for containing our operational plan objectives, of which there will be 178. So that, that guides our work, um, and we've been working closely with our departments on that, as you know. Um, this year, we started to kind of get a feel for performance measurement by working with three departments specifically, probation, parks, and the human services department on a pilot project. 
We've been working to develop um, internal and external dashboards by which we can um, display the outcomes of some of their programs. Uh, along with that, as you heard on the ISD presentation, Kevin Bulling is um, working with us on a Power BI reporting platform. We're gonna be uh, collaborating closely with ISD as we move forward into the larger performance measurement initiative to, to display our outcome measures online. Um, we've also been collaborating with DataShare Santa Cruz County and the Community Assessment Project to work on identifying population level um, indicators that we can use as our community indicators that show what impact we're having within the community. Uh, we plan to report to this board on the preliminary results of our dashboards this fall. And here graphically you can see the look and feel for how we're going to be displaying the, um, the, the progress on our objectives. We're gonna be highlighting our website next week to you on the 25th when we come with our final operational plan. I'll turn it over to Melody. Melody Serino, Deputy County Administrative Officer. Last year, the County Administrative Officer launched the three-year Learn, Engage, Apply, and Perform program to help develop new leaders in the county family. The objective of the program is to value and encourage the active participation of employees at all levels in strategic planning, performance measurement, and process improvement. The program is designed to help develop a common language and culture, provide analytical and problem-solving tools, and encourage cross-departmental collaboration. Participants attend classes once a month, for a year, and then through our partnership with the California State Association of Counties, they also receive their senior executive credential. And then for the Clerk of the Board Office, the office continues to focus on improvements to technology, expanding training, and providing easier access to information to increase the quality and efficiency of the agenda process. Christina Mallory, County Budget Manager. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the County Administrative Office uh, and Clerk of the Board budget. Um, here you can see a representation of the current year and the next two fiscal years. 2019-20, um, our recommended budget provides for an increase of $335,098 in expenditures and an increase of $25,607 in revenues, resulting in an increase from the general fund of $309,481. Um, the majority of that is salaries and benefits for our ex existing staff. Um, the 2020 21 projected budget estimates uh, including a, a projected budget assumes a status quo operation and reflects known changes uh, for staffing with a projected increase to the general fund contribution of $332,431 and the majority of that is for the staffing costs. So here you'll see uh, Budget highlights, it's essentially status quo operations. It supports the 18 funded positions. We have one unfunded position in the clerk of the board's office. And it supports the continuation of the initiatives, including two-year budget, program budgeting, strategic and operational planning, performance measurement, PRIMO, Santa Cruz, our continuous process improvement, the LEAP program, and the long-range facility master plan. In addition, we have funding that's been provided for the 2020 census outreach, and we have some funding expenditures and some funding available from the state included in the budget. Did I go too far? Oh, Oops. did we go too far? There we go. Oh. Okay. So during 2019-20, uh, uh, the departments will be updating their 2021 projections based on any additional information and a revised recommended 2021 budget will be presented to your board during next year's budget hearings, um, hopefully a briefer, shorter budget hearings, uh, depending on the number of changes that we have to present to you. Um, and planning is already underway to develop program budgeting by 21-23. Staff will be reviewing the budget structure with the departments in order to make modifications to the existing system to allow for program budgeting in order to increase transparency about the cost of the various county programs and services. Our objectives over the next two years include increasing public communication and engagement. Last year we provided the public access to an online budget tool at secbudget.com. 
I'm very pleased to show you today that we've made some improvements to this. This year we've expanded the tool to not only include the second year budget, but we've expanded it by including the ability to drill down even further. So here you'll see the graphical presentation. It starts off with the general um, government categories, the various budget categories. You can drill down merely by selecting. So here's the representation of general government and all the general government departments. You can scroll down here. You can see them individually. You can scroll down even further looking at the assessor recorder. And you can see a graphical presentation of the assessor recorder budget and the various divisions. And then you can scroll down further within the assessor and see the unique assessor GL key. So now we can drill down all the way below, beyond the divisions to the general ledger key level. So this is the assessor. And then when you scroll further, you can see the budget broken up by characters. You'll see salaries and benefits, services and supplies. And then when you scroll further, you can get all the way to the line item detail. Which we'll see here. So here you can see regular pay, differential pay, social security. And then at the bottom here, now that comes up, is you'll see a, a brief um, overview of the department. And then a link directly to the budget document. So the public can go out, they can drill down, they can look at the information, they can see a graphical presentation of the information all the way down to the general ledger key level and the line item detail, and they can click directly to the budget document for each department. And eventually our plan is to, to incorporate all the initiatives together in, a, in, an, in an easier to use um, system, but this is what we have for now. earlier. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I'm going to go back. Yeah, just go back. So as we look to better integrate our initiatives, we are researching and reviewing other budget and data software options that uh, create more options for participatory budgeting with the public and easier access and development of the presentation online. So here we have our strategic and operational planning initiatives. Um, we have presented the proposed 2019 to 21 operational plan. It contains 55 strategies and the proposed plan had 172 objectives. There are six that we're hoping to present to you as part of the final plan next Tuesday for a total of 178 based on the feedback we have received um, from the board and the community. Um, developing the operational plan, as you know, was a process through a steering committee and six subcommittees that worked throughout the year to, to conduct engagement both internally in the community. We believe the plan reflects our county values and will reflect equity and sustainability as well. Um, each, every department has a, every objective, excuse me, has at least one collaborating department and many have more than one. Um, we plan to track and update progress on the plan biannually at our Vision Santa Cruz County website, which you see there, sccvision.us. And this website is actually going to refresh next week when we come to the board with the final plan. It's going to show, it, it'll be very dynamic. You'll be able to drill down into each objective and the strategies and sort it by department and uh, other various ways so that you can see progress on the plan. And we plan to present that next week. Oops. So I just wanted to show um, a small number of our objectives. We, we are gonna have 14 total as a department. So here are four for you. Um, today. One is our capital policy objective, which Elisa is going to address a little bit later um, regarding our facilities master planning and campus master planning work. We also have our process improvement objective, which relates to Primo Santa Cruz. Um, we're going to be sponsoring um, some additional staff and projects in cont continuous process improvement, and Elisa will also address this. Um, we have program budgeting, which Christina just spoke about, which we're going to present a two-year budget with financing at the program level by June of 2021. Oops. 
And then last but not least, um, we've been spending a lot of time on the U.S. Census. This is a very important project for us over the course of the next year as we move towards Census Day, April 1st of 2020. Um, we have our um, complete count steering committee and subcommittees which are working on doing um, census implementation and we have, we've been having monthly meetings. We're taking the month of July off but we're gonna reconvene in August and continue to meet monthly as we meet the state requirements um, for doing U.S. Census outreach. Performance measurement, um, as has been mentioned this morning, we started a performance measurement pilot um, that was um, conducted this year, but we plan to expand to the countywide rollout of the larger performance measurement in initiative next year, which we'll be working with more departments, coming up with a training plan for staff. Um, there are two main elements to the initiative. One is developing our community indicators, which will be on a dashboard online on our Vision Santa Cruz County site um, for each of our focus areas. And then also we'll have um, more specific department dashboards that will adopt the results-based accountability framework, which addresses how much we're doing of something, how well we're doing it, and what impact is it having. So we plan to come back this fall with um, some more information on our dashboards and our public-facing website. Um, so we will stay tuned for that. So I'm gonna give you a quick preview for Primo year two. Obviously we're gonna to continue to build on year one success, or progress and success. A lot of that's gonna really come back to supporting the 18 projects we have underway. As our teams um, exit from the actual formal training program, we wanna make sure they have the structure for sort of maintaining their momentum, sticking to the principles and tools, and really actually expanding from just the project team to how is it fitting within the department and the department's culture around continual process improvement. Um, one of the things we're learning is as these teams start, it's creating a lot of very positive engagement and energy, and they're looking for some more structure and ways to focus that and, and sort of maintain it over time. We'll continue with our multi-layer training approach. Uh, one of the, the feedbacks we've gotten from um, folks who are participated in our champions training, and so that was really department and uh, division leaderships that had projects um, nominated for the first year. They had a training, a full day training in January. They kind of got their checklist, but they're sort of, we, we were meeting with our teams, but we still want to get some support on how do we lead differently in a lean environment. So we plan to do some more um, training around coaching from a lean perspective. Another area of feedback we've gotten, um, and this really came from the use of the, te the team's use of a, a, a training technique, which was just a white belt uh, training, an hour video training um, that they frequently asked their, their colleagues that were involved in whatever process they were working on to do before they started getting together to do, whether it was process mapping, you've seen the swim lane maps or some of the other tools. And the, the suggestion has been, how do we come up with a strategy to provide this one hour training for as many employees as possible. So we really all share the same vocabulary around lean as they um, are invited to be part of the work. So we'll be working on that. And then that third element is now that we're gonna have, I guess between the first group, it's about 49 folks who have gone through the green belt training in these two cohorts. How do we support them to sort of maintain that investment we've made in them and, and then they can really bring that to bear in their either their home department or they're supporting other departments moving forward. I do wanna mention one specific aspect of the whole person care cohort. Um, most, of, many of those uh, folks participating are from um, HSA and behavioral health in specific, in specific, but they've also invited community partners to be part of that green belt training since that's such a core part of how we provide service. So it's, it's for me, it I was a very, um, it was great to hear that we were gonna be sharing sort of our lean, lean journey and bringing some of our community partners along with us in a very tangible way. 
Uh, another aspect is we will continue that engagement process with employees and do, as we've called, sort of the road show around projects. So staff who may not have been involved in a specific project still get to see how it works. And so we'll be, we plan to be doing that. And then lastly, we want to spend more focused time on the just do it. So this is, this is that low hanging fruit that people start identifying and really trying to figure out a way to capture that, um, get credit for it so people actually can celebrate what they've been doing and really um, continue to encourage folks. You don't have to go to a green belt training to implement continuous process improvement. You can do it in your own workspace, in your own workplace every day. So year two will be just as busy as year one. Um, it's great though we have a lot more people uh, who are now familiar with lean uh, to participate in and continuing making it grow. Uh, the last initiative I'm going to talk really briefly about is the long range facility and camp camp campus master planning process. Um, this board uh, approved going forward with a request for qualification for a consultant in, in April uh, for us to support this work. Uh, we have uh, gone through consultant uh, review and interviews and, and we'll be working on selecting and developing a scope of work and bringing a contract back to the board in August. This work, the scope is really going to focus on long range facility planning um, and focusing first on Freedom Campus and here at Ocean. Uh, we, and then the deal here is we're going to be focusing on where do we go in the future based on operational needs. We want to really understand do we have folks in the right place. It does come back to the WeWork concept. It comes back to where, where are our customers traveling to and from and how do we inform our uh, future facilities based on current needs. It will also set that broader policy about how do we want to organize ourselves at our campuses and then also really look at what opportunities we, do we have potentially with surplus property to um, advance other community priorities as articulated in the strategic plan. And the most clear ones that we've articulated are around housing and then potential other economic development opportunities. So we expect to bring you that contract in August and really think that work will start kicking off um, in the fall of this year. So that is our summary of sort of the key objectives for the CAO's office going into the next fiscal year. Uh, we uh, ask your, uh, for your support of our recommended budget as referenced on these pages, and we're happy to answer any questions. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, this uh, ambitious plan, and I think what's most <coughs> encouraging is you're, fo we're, you're th following through with what you said you were going to do. And um, I, I just think it, the team effort of, about it has uh, been very well received by the employees uh, that I've talked to. They're really excited to say this is a real deal. They want to know what, we're, what we think and how we can implement programs uh, in the future. So I really appreciate um, you know, just standing up and going out and getting it, as you have, uh, especially from our CAO, uh, Carlos Blasio's on down. Um, I think this is a tremendous program, and uh, I, I uh, can't believe that we have, uh, what, now 178 objectives. I had 172 for some reasons somehow, but I guess a couple more got added. I think I added one or asked for one across 22 departments. So um, I think this collaboration, uh, in the end, is going to energize our employees, but better, or more important than that, it's going to better serve uh, the people of Santa Cruz County. So thank you very much. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation from all of you. It's clear that we have great leadership uh, coming out of the, uh, the uh, CAO's office. Start to the top, but we, but you four are, are, uh, play a key role in uh, going out there and communicating that vision and working with the individual departments. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge the, the, that great work. Um, I think that the, 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 the Primo process, the Lean Initiative, those are all great pieces. Um, and it sounds as though we're off to a good start uh, and thinking about how we deepen it and make it uh, continue um, to be successful past the initial burst of activity, uh, but uh, to make it an ongoing part of the, of the county uh, culture. I did have uh, one question about uh, the operational plan as it relates to the FIT pilot. It was unclear to me exactly what that, what we were, what we were trying to accomplish in this and what we might expect, because these dates seem slightly different than the, than the, than the dates that, uh, 
that we previously talked about. I'm gonna have to like look at the actual objective to make that comparison. What I can say is um, there's, there, and we, when we came to the board in February, the expectation was we would come back in, in September with initial review of the data of the program. So the two year, object, uh, the two -year objective aside, we do plan to be back in front of this board in the fall to talk about the first six plus months of operations and what the experiences are. But let me look at these um, to reconcile your question a little more okay. specifically. I mean, I just, for everybody else, it's on page 116 and it says by June 2020, the county administrative office will coordinate a report on outcomes of the focus intervention team pilot program with the sheriff coroner and health services. So we will do that as well. That will then give us a lot more data, but our intention is to come back in the fall with preliminary um, results and then we'll continue to report on the annual and biannual basis. Yeah, it's a major investment and I just want to make sure we didn't want to go a year and a half before we Absolutely. actually sat down and figured out what we were doing. So, thank you. Any other questions? Let me just say I really appreciate it. it to the extent that the, through the Primo process or even the Just Do It process, that the board can recognize people who take that initiative and sort of help raise attention and also appreciation for people uh, grabbing, grabbing a project uh, and trying to make it happen. Don't hesitate to let us know because we wanna, we wanna support people who are, who, are, who are engaging in this process and thinking about their work differently. Thank you, we'll, we'll fit you into the road show. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, and all right, so uh, Supervisor Kevin. To approve. All right, well first, any public comments? Public, Seeing yeah. none, I'll bring it back now. Then we'll get it, okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, these are, uh, there's no public to approve. comment. Got a motion by Caput, a second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Now we will recess uh, to reconvene uh, at 7 p.m. tonight uh, for the Zone 7 Board of Directors meeting at 7 p.m. and then at 7.30 for a continued public hearing on the budget at the Civic Center Plaza at 275 Main Street in Watsonville. You have a quorum. Are there any changes to the agenda today, Mr. Strudley? Uh, no, they're not. All right, now we'll open it up for oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on the Zone 7 agenda but are within the purview of Zone 7. Would anybody like to address us tonight? Okay. We do. Can I? Right, yeah, please. Director Belisich. Well, first of all, I'd like to announce that the um, City of Watsonville has submitted a benefit cost ratio uh, resolution to the National um, League of Cities, and we hope to hear back on June 24th whether that goes through and will be presented at the National Conference in Austin on, um, in November. So we followed your lead. I appreciate that, Director Bell. Such and that's a, that. that'll be great. You know, the county and the city, if we're together, it'll be a perfect thing. So Appreciate that. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that the uh, legislators are, I think, trying to have a meeting here September 6th. I'm not sure if that date has been confirmed, but um, Jimmy Panetta, our congressman, and other senators, state people, they're supposed to come. We believe it's gonna be on Friday, September 6th. So you can put that on your calendar as a tentative date. And then um, I have to say that the county and the city have done a great job on Bridge Street trying to get rid of uh, all of the weeds that we have there, and, and um, it, it was looking really good, and it's starting to grow again, so I think it's something we may need to address in the near future. Before the 4th of July would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else for oral communications not on the agenda? Chair, if I may provide a comment about that uh, September 6th date. Um, that's a legislative conference that's being organized through the Pajar River Watershed Flood Prevention Authority. And I don't think that date has been confirmed, although that's the anticipated date. And so there'll be invitations circulating once that date is firmed up through the, the FPA. All right, so we'll now move on to item four, which is approval of the Zone 7 Board meeting minutes. Are there any questions on the minutes? Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the minutes? All right, we'll move back to the board for action. Is there a motion? And I'll second. We have a motion from Director Leopold, a second from Director Bilicic. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
That passes unanimously. Move on to item five, which is just the action on the consent agenda, which happens to be item six. There's one item on the consent agenda. Are there any questions or concerns about the consent agenda item seven? Anybody from the community that would like to address us on this consent agenda item? Okay, we'll move it back to the board. Director Bilicich. Make a motion to approve. Second. So we have a motion for approval of the consent agenda from Director Bilicich and a second from Director Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move on to the regular agenda. Item seven is the first item on the regular agenda, which is of the Board of Directors of Zone 7, a public hearing on Zone 7 assessment rates for the 2019-20 fiscal year to hear objections and protests, if any, and to consider adoption of a resolution confirming the rate report as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the resolution confirming the assessment rates in the summary of the assessment rates. Good evening, Mr. Stradley, for this item. Thank you, Chair, friend, members of the board. Uh, on March 26, 2019, the board adopted a resolution confirming the previously approved increases in assessment rates for Zone 7 um, for the 2019-20 fiscal year. Um, there is an attached summary of those rates included with this agenda item. Um, further, the board set today as a public hearing for the 2019-20 assessment rate report for Zone 7. So in order to complete the 2019-20 assessment rate proceedings, we recommend that the board open public hearing and hear objections and protests, if any, to the proposed 2019-20 assessment rate report for Zone 7 and close the public hearing and also adopt a resolution confirming the written report on assessment rates for the 2019-20 fiscal year. Thank you, Mr. Strawley. Other questions before we open up the public hearing for many of the directors? Okay, this is a public hearing. We'd now like to open the public hearing. Anybody from the community would like to address us on item seven? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. So moved. Second. We have a motion of the recommended actions from Director Bilicich and a second from Director Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Moving on to item eight, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider the 2019 through 2021 proposed budgets for Zone 7 as outlined in the reference budget documents in the memo of the district engineer. We have the proposed budget. We have the narrative, the attachment B, the semi-annual report from July to December, the proposed budget, the capital improvement detail, and the continuing agreement list. Uh, Mr. Strudley again. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the board. Um, the June meeting is our annual budget hearing meeting, and the budget for Zone 7 was previously approved by the Watsonville City Council at its June 11th, 2019 meeting. Um, the pr process is that the budget is then approved by Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors following the Zone 7, your board's approval. Um, and that will happen later this week. Um, the budget that we include for your consideration here has recommended capital improvements in the amounts of $2,534,536 uh, in 2019-20 and 2019 also presenting information to you in accordance with the new procedures for the county. Uh, two-year budget cycle, so we're also presenting the 2020-21 information for you, which includes a capital improvement of $2,315,176. Um, these budgets are required to have a zero uh, dollar unappropriated fund balance for each of the two fiscal years, so uh, we include information on the expenditures and fund balances in the attachments, notably um, Packet page 19 has the fund summary with uh, summaries for the capital improvements as well as the information on reserves and fund balance and revenues. The packet page 20 um, is the capital budget or fixed asset detail for your consideration for both fiscal years. Um, page 21 outlines some budget detail for maintenance operations in the two years proposed budget. And we have budget narratives starting on page 23 for both, uh, for the budget detail um, for both fiscal years. And with that, uh, it is recommended that uh, the board consider approval of the 2019 through 21 proposed budgets for Zone 7 Flood Control and Water Conservation District as outlined in pages 309 and 532 and the errata, which is also included as an attachment, and accept and file the semi-annual levy inspection report, which is also included as an attachment to the sport item. Thank you, Mr. Strudley. Any questions from directors on this item? Director Belsich, please. Um, I noticed that we have a contribution to the Army Corps. Is that out of this budget? 
So we are still including a contribution to the Army Corps under the hope that we will be able to secure some work plan funds from this year's upcoming fiscal federal fiscal year budget cycle. So the Army Corps has made a capability request and we have injected appropriations language into the House Energy and Water Bill, which is moving through its paces right now. So we hope to secure those work plan funds. Thank you. All right, we'll now open it up for the community. Anybody in the community like to address us on the budget? All right, well then I'll bring it back to the board for action. Director Bilsich, please. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the budget. Second. Right, we have a motion from Director Bilicic. We have a second from Director Leopold. I assume that's for all the items on the list, Director Bilicic? Yes. Correct? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Move on to item nine, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider a status update on the Shell Road pump station and the Coastal Resiliency Project for the Lower Watsonville Slough as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. Just as a reminder, this was a request of the board previously that we come back with information at this meeting. So we appreciate that you followed through on that, Director Strudley. Thank you. So item thank, nine. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the board, um, and Director Caput responding to your request from the January 15th, 2019 meeting to return to the board to discuss uh, flood risk reduction associated with the Shell Road pump station and the lower Watsonville Slough area. Um, after much consideration uh, and background work, um, along with information that we've obtained on potential costs of a remedy uh, to Shell Road pump station, um, and the fact that sea level rise isn't expected to slow down anytime soon, um, we would like to pursue a, a much more comprehensive project through the Pajaro Storm Drain Maintenance District, looking at a combined multi-benefit project in the lower Watsonville Slough. Uh, the objective here is to reduce flood pressure, um, to reduce or eliminate the need to breach the Pajaro River Lagoon, which is an, ex an expensive endeavor, difficult to permit, uh, time-consuming uh, issue, uh, and also to remedy the, sh the aging Shell Road pump station and to analyze what the most salient approach is with that specific facility. Um, the approach that the Power Storm Drain Maintenance District is taking is to engage the Army Corps of Engineers, a completely different set of individuals, might I add, uh, from the Army Corps that deals with flood risk reduction. This is through the Continuing Authorities Program. Um, the funding mechanism is completely different and auth already authorized, um, but the idea is to embark on a feasibility and initial 35% design phase project with the Army Corps of Engineers, and it would be cost shared between the Army Corps and the local sponsors, and we, the Pajaro Storm Drain Maintenance District has um, sent now three different grant applications to various state agencies to cover the cost share component for the local sponsor, the Power of Storm Drain Maintenance District. So the objective is to have all costs covered um, to examine what the most uh, reasonable approach is to deal with sea level rise and increasing flood pressure in the lowest portion of the watershed. And so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, the recommendation for the board is to accept and file the status report on the Shell Road pump station and the project that we are proposing, which is called the Coastal Resiliency uh, project for the Lower Watsonville Slough. Okay. Thank you, Director Strudley. Strudley, there's some exciting information actually to be presented. Uh, Director Caput, I believe you have some questions. Right. Uh, we're talking about the uh, Pajaro Dunes, right? Correct. That is a component of the... Right. Yeah. And uh, really, uh, has anything actually been done in the last 10 years? I think money was... Uh, uh, voted for to go towards that project for the pump and so where has that money gone right so last year we uh, proposed an line item in our zone 7 budget um, to address capital improvements at Shell Road pump as had been articulated in the formation documents of zone 7 as one of the higher priority capital improvements um, we put in a line item for $300,000 in that budget. It was approved by our board last year. We used that money to embark on a feasibility analysis to look at um, securing hazard mitigation grant funding to support Shell Road pumps and other facilities. And it didn't pan out. And we also, our, our engineer uh, in Zone 7 
Rusty Barker did some analysis on the history of that pump station and the alternatives analysis that was done in the past. And it's become clear to us that a much more comprehensive solution is probably warranted. Sure. And, and, and uh, the reason it's uh, more comprehensive is we're dealing with uh, uh, salt water coming in and also fresh water flowing out, right? That's where they, they meet? It's, it's comprehensive because there's a lot of different problems that are associated with flooding down in the lower watershed. So part of it is salt water issue with the lagoon, um, affecting farmland, affecting road passage. Um, we also have the emergency breaching program, which is something like we would like to get out of the business of doing if possible. Um, but also the multi-benefit aspects of a project are necessary to leverage state funding and grant funding. And that's the business that the state is in supporting nowadays for these types of projects. And, and right now, at the, uh, uh, there, is there a pump that's not working right at the Shell uh, pump station? No, it's, it's working. Um, there have been a couple repair jobs when it's had leaks, but it is functioning, operating as it was designed. Right. Okay. If, if it were uh, running at uh, top capacity and we were able to get work done on it, would that uh, eliminate the necessity of uh, breaching the, uh, 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 what, uh, the sand? No, it wouldn't eliminate the need at all. Wouldn't. Okay, so what would the benefit be then? The benefit of this project? Yeah. The benefit of this project would be providing additional space for the water to go in the tidal prism in the slough. Right. So you provide more space for it rather than relying simply on the pump station to evacuate water and the breaching program to eliminate the flooding concern. You'd provide more space for the water. And in doing so, you'd provide opportunities for habitat, for recreation, for public access, and also for improvements to the facilities like the breach road cross crossing over the slough. And do we have a... a a ballpark figure of a total cost if we were able to do everything we wanted to do? We don't have a total cost for um, implementation of a project. What we have right now is a figure of roughly $1.5 million for feasibility and 35% design plans and specs. Um, and again, the idea is to share those costs evenly split between the Army Corps and grant funding coming from one of the various state agencies for which we've applied for grant funding. Right. I, I guess w one of the complaints we've all, most of us have had is uh, when you're, we're dealing with the Army Corps, we give them a lot of money uh, we, and they, uh, they collect it. They're very good at cashing the checks. <laughs> and then they, they, uh, they just put it off and they put it off. Yeah. So we're trying to get grant money to kind of do an end run. So uh, I entered into this approach with some hesitancy and, and reticence because of our history and dealings with the Army Corps. Um, but what I've come to discover, not only is it a completely separate group of individuals under a separate funding mechanism that's already authorized, been authorized by Congress, um, the projects under the CAP authority are much smaller and they tend to have a much higher success rate. They tend to be executed in relatively quickly. One of their recent projects through the Army Corps District was uh, executed by Sonoma County Water Agency on Dry Creek. And it was a pretty large project. It was a 10 or $15 million implementation project, but it was implemented in a couple of years. So the expectation is following uh, a roughly two year period to get through initial feasibility and 35% design that we can move relatively quickly in the, in the next two or three years to get through the rest of the design and implementation. Thank you, anybody else? Please. Thank you, Mark, great report. I, I've um, been involved through the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency with related problems down in that reach. And as you know, the water agency has a project on Harkins Slough, which has not been able to take water because that flood, when the king tides come over and top, they go, five miles up the slough and m render the water agency's pr project where they take water off the slough completely unusable because of the salinity. Um, the last 20 years down there, I've seen those farmlands right close to Pajaro Dunes get inundated with saline water. And I know that renders them unusable for, for 
several years. So I think the opportunity there to follow some of that land and turn it into wetlands, maybe kind of like a soap late thing to attenuate some of the flooding is a fantastic opportunity. So I'm really delighted that you all are proceeding with this. I think it'll be a win-win for a, a lot of different purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bannister. Anybody else before you open it up? It's not an action item, but for, would anybody from the community like to address this on this item? Please. Thank you, Becky Steinberg. I'm a resident of Aptos, but I have had friends over the years that live and work in the Pajaro Dunes area. And um, I applaud your efforts, Mr. Strudley, to help that area and hope that um, to strengthen the grant applications that the fire station that is also there would be um, certainly considered and you could get some letters of support from that agency. Um, they are the first in for many incidents on San Andreas Road in that area and um, in flooded times that uh, re emergency response would be hampered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else on this non-action item? Okay, thank you for uh, that work. It's just a consideration of the status item uh, updates. There was no direct action item. Correct. So we'll move on to item 10, which also is a non-action item, which is a program manager's report for Zone 7. So is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider a status update on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project as outlined in the memo of the District Engineer, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the Board. We are still moving vigorously on our Army Corps uh, flood risk reduction project for the Pajaro River. Um, we are, as I've told you several times before at our past meetings, that we're kind of on hold with the Army Corps right now, awaiting um, the hopeful uh, securance of uh, work plan funds um, later this calendar year. At this point in time, we are moving through the paces of initial work towards CEQA environmental review. Um, I will note that in the board memo here, uh, it's noted that the notice of preparation submittal is scheduled for early September. It will likely be later than that due to some recent uh, activity that we've had with our program management consultants since the writing and submission of this board memo. Um, it's, be became, it's become clear to us that we need to do a little bit more thinking and work on some uh, locally led alternatives to the project to help uh, leverage both the state and federal investment. And we don't want to short circuit our CEQA process by prematurely um, moving too far along that process without having the right alternatives analysis in place. Um, that won't really sacrifice anything towards the project and in fact it, it puts us in a much better position to have the right alternatives analysis and make sure that our money is well spent towards CEQA environmental review. Our program management consultant is still working uh, diligently with us um, on governance and finance aspects. We've had now the first two governance and finance committee meetings. Uh, the second uh, at which we um, presented some basic f conceptual finance plans to give the committee a rough idea of the uh, rate assessments that um, will be considered. Uh, we're also moving through the final stages of internal review of our draft JPA agreement and within the next uh, month to month and a half we'll be circulating that to the potential member agencies uh, for their consideration and review. Um, we're continuing to coordinate with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, both on projects or aspects related to the flood risk reduction project, as well as some uh, lingering aspects of the PL 8499 repairs that were completed last summer. There is one site remaining on Salsipoitis Creek on the opposite side away from the city uh, that still needs to be repaired. Um, that was misidentified in the original report from the Army Corps, and they've agreed that they're going to repair it. So we are nudging and poking and prodding them uh, over the last month to go repair that uh, and finish the slurry seal that they're going to coat the levee trail, levee top road on Salsa Place Creek with to complete that repair. Um, we continue to work with our state partners at Department of Water Resources, um, both on our subventions authorization as well as brainstorming potential ways in which we can leverage state funding for multi-benefit components of the project. Um, we've had some very uh, promising discussions with DWR through uh, Assemblymember Mark Stone's office 
uh, and we've also had uh, a visit facilitated through the city of Watsonville, thank you city of <coughs> Watsonville, uh, with assembly member uh, Revis out on the levee and I had the chance to speak with him um, about a week ago for about 15 minutes about the project. So we've had some very positive indications coming from the state about their interest in our project, supporting a, a, a more um, adaptable funding mechanism that leverages both state and federal financing. Uh, and we're very hopeful of um, those funding sources and getting a lot more support from the state than we have from the feds. Um, that is all I have to report to you on the progress so far. And uh, it's recommended that your board accept and file the status report on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from directors on this item? Director Caput? Sure. Uh, thank you. I know this is very difficult and you keep going forward, which is uh, wonderful. And uh, I, I don't know, could you just give a brief uh, overview for the, uh, about the joint powers uh, group we're trying to, you know, form? And uh, I think what, uh, there was good news and bad news when we, uh, when we had the meeting of the BCR benefit cost ratios gone down, but we do have a plan to actually start working uh, right. which uh, would be a, a, f a first for the last, you know, 40 years as far as when we're talking about the uh, uh, flood prevention project. So I don't know, if you give, just give a brief overview of that. Uh, what's exciting to me is that we would actually be moving some dirt. We'd be actually doing something uh, and not just still waiting for the Army Corps to give a go-ahead go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to provide some more detail on this. Um, yeah, so the the benefit cost ratio for the project did slip um, more um, since we last spoke. It's now down below Unity to 0.96. Um, there's not a lot of satisfying reason why that is, but the end game here with the core is that a 0.96 benefit cost ratio is not all that different from something slightly above unity. What Ultimately, the, the game is still the same. We're still at the bottom of the barrel in terms of their ranking system, and it means we're going to have some stiff competition and some challenges securing federal investment. Um, that being said, the uh, you mentioned uh, some excitement about potentially uh, seeking some support from the state. We still have a lot of hurdles to go through, including CEQA, um, as well as financing the project um, through through the governance and finance activities that we're pursuing. Um, but there is some promise coming from the state. Um, they're much more willing to support a project like ours with the benefits that we've described. Um, we've actually received the recommendation from DWR to uh, try to secure our subventions funds in the absence of the Army Corps. That, along with some other kind of opportunity, whether it's directed or competitive funding from the state, uh, potentially open some doors for us to secure funding to pursue components of the project that the Army Corps would be less interested in pursuing. And those would be the pieces of the project that have incrementally smaller benefit cost ratios as measured by the federal government. So, for example, that would be sides like the Monterey County side, which uh, the Army Corps does not weigh the ag agricultural advantages of the protecting that side nor the disadvantaged community structure of the town of Pajaro in very high position in their ranking system. But that is, those are the values that the state is very interested in, in protecting. And so there is some opportunity there. Um, the Governance and Finance Committee uh, is working towards um, developing a joint powers authority. And we are working towards forming a joint powers authority as was initially recommended through the 2016 Governance and Finance Committee. And that was reiterated again in the uh, restart of the Governance and Finance Committee several months ago that that is the direction that is the wisest to take in terms of forming a governmental body to oversee the capital improvements and long-term O&M of a project that straddles the two county, the, the county boundary and includes jurisdiction, protects jurisdiction in the city of Watsonville. Yeah, I, I, and I won't belabor, belabor this, uh, but and I, we're doing, you're moving forward, which is wonderful. Uh, 
there's two huge agencies involved uh, always with flooding. Uh, one, of course, is the Army Corps. They, they sh their responsibility should be a preventative work. And then you have FEMA, which comes in and uh, is reactive and pretty much has to pay the bill after it floods. They don't seem to talk. They don't seem to get along. They're, there's something, they're, they're almost working against each other. If I was the head of FEMA, I'd be furious with uh, the Army Corps because the government is spending uh, a lot more money trying to fix something after the fact rather than preventative uh, costs. Yeah, agreed. There's, it's a bit perplexing how they, they operate independently and sometimes at odds with one another. Um, we share that frustration. Um, the reality is is that it's going to be very difficult unless something really amazing comes through with, from the state to pursue this project independent of the Army Corps authorization that we have. There's still uh, some good money to be leveraged from the federal government. Uh, it's not to say that we can't do it independently, but it's not very likely. Um, and we will be having more discussions with FEMA as we move through any kind of construction that would ensue uh, from the project because our objective is to reduce or eliminate a lot of people's flood insurance premiums. Thank you. I'll open it up now for the community. Anybody in the community like to address us on this item? Okay, that was a non-action item. So that, that's the end of the Zone 7 agenda. Thank you for those that serve on Zone 7 for coming in. Director Bannister, Director Vilsich, appreciate you coming for this. You're welcome. Great, thank you. And now we'll uh, continue the public hearing on the 2019 to 21 proposed county budgets as outlined in the reference uh, budget documents in the memorandum of the CAO. Uh, <coughs> and I'm gonna ask, um, as the Board of Supervisors convenes. First, I want to let uh, anyone know in the audience that we do have translation services available. So uh, if you would like translation services, uh, please uh, access them uh, right over here. Second is uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Palacios to give the presentation uh, that he gave this morning outlining the uh, overall uh, state of our county budget and the plans for the next two years. Uh, we were gonna she went to go get the remote can you okay. change the move of the screens or no oh you can okay so i'll go ahead and start then uh, so today is the first day of county budget hearings uh, we will be having budget hearings all week monday through thursday uh, in the morning tomorrow evening we will be in santa cruz uh, at 7 p.m uh, also and then next tuesday um, we will have our um, final day and the approval of the budget and the operations plan and the supplemental continuing agreements and list um, on Tuesday at the at the board meeting in the afternoon at 1.30. Um, if you could go ahead and move ahead. So I'm going to cover uh, county initiatives and our operational plan, give a brief overview of our budget, both for the budget year, which is 2019 and 20, and then the second year of our budget, which is 2021. And then I will briefly talk about uh, challenges and opportunities. If you go to the next one. So this uh, outlines um, the work plan that we have set out uh, for ourselves in the county. We have uh, last year begun a strategic planning process. This is a six year um, time frame for this document. In that process, we developed um, six uh, focus areas, and within each focus area are uh, four overarching goals. So there's a total of 24 um, big goals for the county, um, and we adopted that last year after a great deal of um, of community outreach. This year we are, uh, for the first time, adopting our operational plan. It's a two-year document and our um, two-year budget, and that also is a first for the county. And so the operational plan and the two-year budget are meant to implement the strategic plan, implement each of those goals um, that are outlined in the overarching strategic plan. Um, 
following this year, we're, next year we will begin uh, program um, performance measurement, um, and that will be a n major new initiative where we will be evaluating um, our programs and seeing which are most effective. We will be doing a lot of training uh, next year uh, with our staff and also some pilot projects. And then we will continue implementing uh, our continuous process improvement or PRIMO effort. Uh, that began um, this year with some pilot projects and will continue in um, to the future. So this is how our, uh, there's the focus areas, the six focus areas. Each of them has four uh, major goals within each focus area. And then you can see this planning cycle all revolving around the strategic plan. Uh, and we've basically finished uh, the first part of that in this year, the strategic plan, operational plan, two-year budget. Uh, there will be three, um, three operational plans and three two-year budgets within this strategic plan cycle. And then we are just now beginning performance measurement, continuous process improvement. Uh, this lays out how the strategic plan uh, relates to the operational plan. Um, the strategic plan tells us who we are, what we stand for, what we want to achieve in terms of our goals. And then the operational plan tells very specifically what we will do and how we will do it and how we will fund it. This was the time frame for the strategic plan. Basically, we've been at, uh, working on it for more than, for about a year. Started with the internal steering committee um, that worked um, throughout the fall, and then in the um, this year in the winter we began the actual uh, outreach to community groups, and then in by April we had had meetings with focus groups, key informants, and community outreach. And now we are at the point where the board will be adopting it. And we had operate. We had a, on the operational plan this year. We had outreach uh, throughout uh, the county, um, both the north, south, and mid county focus groups and community meetings. This is an example of how the operational plan um, ties to the budget. So this happens to be um, objective. Um, uh, 64, which is on page 30 and page 146 of the operational plan. It says, by June 2021, health services will increase access to health care by decreasing the wait time for the next available appointment from an average of 1.3 days down to zero days. And that is the objective. And then in the budget, um, if you were to go to page 173 of the budget, you would find this item, which is funding uh, new staff. Uh, at Emmeline and Watsonville, list the staff and the cost, which will allow us to get our wait times um, down to zero, basically service on demand for our clinics. Uh, the board has been very um, prudent in managing our finances. We, over the last few years, we have tripled the amount of our reserves. Uh, we've now reached our 10% uh, goal. We've uh, reduced pension obligations both through the board's own actions and through cooperation with our employee groups. Um, we even controlled employee growth. We actually are at less employees still to this day than we had uh, before the Great Recession in 2009. And that, despite the fact that we've actually increased the amount of services that we're prov providing the community. And we've also made some big strides in dealing with some of our defer deferred maintenance issues. Uh, we have uh, augmented services this year. Uh, just to give you some examples, um, the Nurse Family Partnership, Thrive by Three, Whole Person Care, and Medi-Cal Drug Expansion uh, all have worked to improve uh, community health. We've also made major new investments in our homeless services, expanding our shelter, emergency shelter, and um, other services, homeless services, especially to our youth. Um, finally, in the area of public safety, we've opened new facilities at Roundtree and Blaine Street, the Sobering Center, all designed to re reduce recidivism and transition offenders back into our community. I'll now give you a very brief um, view of the budget. Uh, we'll kind of go through this pretty quickly. So this is the overall budget. It shows the adopted uh, budget in the current year, which is 2018-19. It shows uh, the proposed budget, which is 
2019 and 20. You can see that the general fund um, has grown by about eight, $18 million. And then it shows the second year of the budget, and this is the first time that we will be adopting a second year budget although it'll be, in effect, not a legally binding document in the second year. It's really a more of a detailed projection, and that shows a total of $570 million in the general fund. Um, the total budget of the county um, has grown um, to about eight, over $800 million. You can see it kind of varies due to capital, and that's uh, the variance that you see there. Our staffing is still is about 2,400 employees. It's still less than we had uh, before the Great Recession. These are our major revenue sources. Um, you'll see that our property tax is going to grow about 4.5% in the budget year, and then in the out year, it's about 3.5%. So we're seeing uh, some slowing cannabis business tax uh, estimated to grow about 5%. Sales tax, 4% um, in the budget year, and in the out year, 3.5%. Um, the TOT or hotel tax is uh, projected 5% growth for each of those years. So we're seeing some slowdown in our uh, major revenues. Our property tax actually is about half of our, our discretionary revenues, and you can see that is, is slowing in the budget year. This is just another view of our, the growth in our property tax and sales tax. You can go to the next one. So this is uh, the entire budget. If you look at our entire almost $800 million budget, and you can see um, Health and Human Services are about 40% of our bu entire budget. Um, you can see that in the entire budget, public safety is only about 8%, and general revenues for the county only are about 20% 20, um, 20 total. These are all our revenues, and you can say that, see that over 40% of our revenues uh, come from state and federal sources, and only 23% come from taxes. This is our uh, funds, all funds, again, are uh, for 1920, and you can see, again, uh, the distribution of the expenses and health and human services being the major one. This is our staffing, and you can see that uh, almost half of our staff in the county, are almost 2,500 staff are in health and human services, you can see public, service, public safety is about a quarter. General fund uh, revenues, um, again, you can see um, that in the general fund, which is about $552 million, uh, almost more than half of it is health and human services. This is the expenditures um, in the general fund, uh, and in the general fund, 60% um, are for Health and Human Services, 26% public safety. Uh, this is our um, discretionary dollars, so this is what we call our general fund contribution, or uh, we used to call it the net county cost. Uh, it's grown to about 162 million. Uh, these are those revenue sources that are not that are discretionary for the board. So they would be equivalent to a city's general fund. And um, you can see that it's grown uh, from what it, when I first came here. It was about $125 million. It's now $162 million four years later. Uh, but you can see that um, more than half goes to public safety of our discretionary dollars. Uh, this is just a summary of our general fund um, revenues and expend expenditures by category. I'll now look briefly at the 2021 um, budget. So this is the out year. Um, and you can see that, um, once again, um, we are having a um, net fund balance available of about $6.2 million. You can see in the very left-hand column, 1819, that's the adopted budget. We had fund balance of about $6.2 million. So that's the amount of money that you have at the end of the year. Um, when uh, that's from salary savings and budgetary reversions. And you can see in the 1920, that's the budget year, is about the same amount. Uh, the problem begins in the out year, 2021, uh, when we have uh, $6.2 million of fund balance, but we also 
have a shortfall of another $6.4 million. So we would need um, $12.6 million to balance the budget. Uh, we are counting on 6.2 as our normal fund balance that's available. So we project a shortfall at this point, absent any changes in 2021 in the out year. This is an example of uh, our budget deficit uh, in the out year. Uh, this year, uh, 1920, that's the very item on the left. You can see it's a balanced budget. So this budget year, we are balanced. But in the out year, 2021, um, we have a, a deficit of about um, anywhere from $6 million to $12 million. Uh, the $12 million would be as if there was a recession. And then it kind of um, decreases slightly, and um, by 2024, we're in much better shape. But you can see in the next couple years, we're going to have a difficult time um, balancing the budget. The general fund reserves have grown steadily. The board has been very committed to fiscal prudence, and you can see that uh, we are now over um, $58 million of reserves, and it's 10% of our general fund revenues. So the challenges and opportunities that we face um, in the coming year, let me just go through those real quickly. Um, behavioral health and substance use disorder, we have actually made a great deal of progress. Uh, we've invested many uh, new funds coming from the state and federal government, but we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us um, given the opioid crisis and the homeless crisis and so forth. Uh, parks and recreation, we have historically uh, underinvested, even though we are now making some major investments, some of them due to grant funds, and some of them uh, due to Measure G, the county's Measure G, which allowed us to invest in our in our parks. And um, about six parks are being partially funded through Measure G. Uh, we've made some progress in deferred maintenance, but we have a ways to go. This is all our facilities where we just haven't had the money to invest in the past, and that's probably one of the areas I most worry about. Roads and storm drains, um, bridges. Um, we have had new resources from SB1, which is the state gas tax, Measure D, which is the local half cent sales tax. And our own, uh, we're actually putting some of our own funds into roads, storm drains, bridges as well. But there's still um, a, lot way, a long way to go in deferred maintenance as well as the storm damaged roads that we had from um, 2016 and 17. So as um, the budget year, the good news is that we're a balanced budget. Um, we haven't had to make any cutbacks this year. Uh, so that's the good news. But the bad news is that in the out year 2021, we see costs rising faster than revenues. Um, we're worried about a potential recession approaching. Um, we're also worried about the housing shortfall in throughout the state of California and the impact it has on on our community, and then we also worry about the winter storm damaged roads st shortfall as well because we have not seen the same reimbursements we had hoped for from the federal government. There seems to be a lack of funding available you know, for disaster aid, and that is having an impact uh, on our county budget. Some of the opportunities are potential new revenue measures, um, our transient occupancy tax, um, is about is at 11 percent, and there's uh, other communities in our county that are at 12 percent. Uh, some communities in Santa Clara and Monterey are at 14 percent. So that's something we should take a look at. Also, our 911 fee is uh, outdated in that it is not. Um, um, it hasn't been updated to take uh, account of modern technology. And then we we should look at CSA 48 and how county fire is being funded and see what we can do. Uh, to make sure it's more sustainable in the long term. We've done a great job of leveraging public and private grants and partnerships. Uh, we have reserves that we can use if, if we have to. Um, we don't advise it on an ongoing basis, but we do have reserves that the, the board has set aside. And then we have um, a very low debt, um, debt ratio of only 1% of our general fund uh, expenditures, which is very low. And so, and actually the majority, two thirds of our debt will be paid off within the next decade, eight to 10 years actually. So we're, we've been very prudent, the board has been very prudent in the past and that's put, in a, put us in a good position uh, to weather whatever storm lies ahead with a potential recession. 
So that uh, concludes my presentation. We will continue uh, with our work plan. Our operational plan and two-year budget will be adopted this year. We will continue with performance measurement and continuous processing, uh, continuous process improvement. Um, and again, we're urging uh, fiscal restraint given the challenges uh, ahead of us. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? We heard all this presentation this morning and had a lively discussion. Uh, now is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that, uh, this item if they wish, or the budget overall. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for that good report. I would um, appreciate if there were copies of that, hard copies of that available for the audience. Um, it's very good, thank you. Um, it, it bothers me, I, I was able to very quickly today look at some of the uh, staff memos on some of the items that are of particular interest to me. Um, from what I could see, Public Works, which you will budget, which you will consider on Wednesday, is going to see decrease from what I see, a 5.5% decrease in the coming year, and then after that, a 20.4% decrease. And I understood that there's some complexity there because of the funding of um, the storm repair and all that, but um, I, I would like a bit of clarification with Measure D and everything um, that we're not that we're going to see infrastructure continue to be repaired, and I understand this one of the challenges. Um, also, in a part of the documents I read today, there's still 17 million dollars in the redevelopment successor agency. I'd like to see what's going to happen with that. I would like to know, in terms of uh, the health and human services, where the $10 million state grant money that we got is going to go. In terms of um, items that you addressed today that I could not attend the hearing for, um, I'm a bit confused by the budget contingencies that they will go down 52% uh, this year and down further 28.9% next year, and, and I don't quite understand that. It, has, it seems to be tied to general revenue, um, but I, I would like explanation of that as just a citizen trying to make sense of this very complex budget. Um, at a time when we're looking at uh, a tw six to $12 million uh, deficit, I question whether it is prudent to continue to increase um, the CAO budget, um, I see that's going to get a 7.6% a increase this year, and um, I don't think that's right. I see that the Board of Supervisors Office uh, will take a modest 1.2% increase this year, but next year, when the deficit is predicted to be very high, their increase will go up to 4.7%, and that doesn't make much sense given what you've just said here. I have big concerns um, regarding county fire. I have, um, I would like to know if in your pie charts, county fire is included in public safety. It should be. And if it is, it should be funded with this money. I know that you are- Thank uh, you, Ms. Steinbrenner, your time's up. <coughs> Thank you, I've made a lot of effort to come here tonight and I appreciate your patience. Thank you. And you asked a lot of uh, complex questions. We won't answer them now, but if you put them in an email, the relevant staff can try to uh, respond. Thank you. So uh, seeing no other speakers, uh, I'll bring it back to the board. There's no action. Is there anyone else who, uh, any other questions or comments from board members? Okay, seeing none, we're going to continue uh, our budget hearings to 9 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, at the Governmental Center at 701 Ocean Street, and uh, uh, we'll be there uh, both tomorrow during the day and tomorrow night to give people an opportunity to participate in the budget. Thank you.